I can't believe I'm a quarter of the way through One Piece. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to How to Train Your Gavin. How are you doing? I hope you're doing well. Let me know in the comments. I'm so sad because it's almost Christmas as of filming this video and I ordered quite a few One Piece Christmas shirts and jumpers and things like that. And only one of them have come and I wore it in the Jaya art video. So I'm gonna have quite a few One Piece Christmas jumpers and shirts that I'll be wearing in the new year. I hope you don't mind. I'm not paying that much money just to not use them until next, absolutely not. So my One Piece saga continues in this video. I will be reading the entire Skypea arc, which is volumes 26 through 32 of the English volumes at least. There are 66 chapters too, so it's three chapters more than the Alabaster saga. So I anticipate this video to be over two hours long, which I'm kind of excited for. Oh, not gonna lie. And this does cover chapters 237 through to 302. I cannot believe I'm gonna get to the 300th chapter. Like I feel like that's a great milestone to hit for One Piece, especially having started only three months ago. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who have read it quicker than I have, but I'm like literally dissecting it. I'm taking it bit by bit so that I can do these videos for you guys, as well as everything else that I read outside of One Piece. If I just read One Piece from September, I genuinely believe I would have caught up by now. Honestly, if I wasn't a booktuber, I would have read 100 chapters a day. But I am glad I am documenting my experience reading One Piece for the first time. And I really appreciate you guys for joining me on this journey. So remember that this is my first time reading One Piece, so I don't know anything that's happening in the future. So I haven't read the Skypea arc yet, that's what I'm gonna do in this vlog. So please try not to spoil anything after the Skypea arc, after I post this video. I might have caught up by the time you watch this in the future, but just to be safe, no spoilers, please. However, I do want to talk everything One Piece with you in the comments. So let me know your thoughts on the Skypea arc down below. Let me know your thoughts on my thoughts. What did you like? What did you dislike? Everything. I want to know everything. And I also love it when you guys point out things that I've missed. So please, please, please do continue to do that. I really appreciate it. The Skypea arc is the final arc in the Skypea saga. So the Jaya arc I have got a video for. I will link the playlist for all my One Piece videos down in the description box if you missed any of them. But I did read the Jaya arc, I think it was last week. And now, it's time for Skypea, and what a better way to spend the week of Christmas, am I right? I really don't have anything else to say, I think. I'm just gonna go straight into reading these bad boys. This video is gonna be long as it is, so if you do end up liking this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing if you haven't already. That would mean the world to me. Anyway, let's resolve that cliffhanger after the Jaya arc and see if the Straw Hats made it to Skypea. I mean, I'd assume they had, but still. Of course, our straw hats were gonna make it to, well, at least the clouds in the sky. It was some kind of like cloud ocean. And Robin says it must be the middle level of the Emperor Cloud because the log poles are still pointing up. So they still have a ways to go, but already they've come across this incredible vast whiteness of clouds and they're sailing through it. And that's just so insane. And even a couple of the characters are like, well, you can't exactly sail the clouds, but that's what they're doing essentially. And there are even fish that have adapted to swimming in these like clouds. At least like it's a cloud ocean kind of thing. And Usopp for some reason jumps into it. I mean, for him to be the most cowardly of the bunch, he does jump into an unknown ocean, which you know, he does get berated for. And then, oh my God, what was amazing was that Luffy had put his hand down and you know, was using his stretching abilities to try and get Usopp, but then he couldn't really see him. But then Nico Robin, she touches Luffy and she kind of transfers her powers to him in a way. Like her eyes come through on his arm so that they can see. And as well as that, but like limbs start sprouting from his hand as well, which is Nico Robin's power. So that was so cool. I hadn't realized that you could like transfer your power like that. That was awesome. I don't think I've seen that happen before, although I could be totally wrong. But that was so awesome. See, this is what I mean. I think I mentioned back in Alabaster how, you know, a lot of the straw hats were separated as they were battling people. And I was saying, oh, it'd be great. Like, could you imagine if all of them at once took on an enemy, you know, rather than splitting them off into like different sub battles kind of thing. But like, if they can sort of transfer their powers amongst one another, I mean, I guess... Nico Robin and Luffy are really the only ones with Devil Fruit powers. So I guess it does make sense that this hasn't happened before because yeah, this is really probably probably gonna be like the first arc where Nico Robin like really comes through as a straw hat. I mean, she was part of the crew in the Jaya arc, but she kind of did her own thing for the majority of that arc. And thank God as well, because the straw hats would not have gotten as far as they did without her. But now I think we're gonna really see Nico Robin be incorporated into the straw hats. And like, I still don't know if she's gonna last or not, but I'll be pleasantly surprised if she sticks around. It does make sense that Nico Robin would stay with them 
to achieve her dream too. Like, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just need to say more of Nico Robin, in all honesty. Like, I am loving her. I think she's awesome. She's so iconic already. But yeah, good first chapter of the Skypiea arc. I absolutely love, like, one of my favourite parts of this was when Nami and Nico Robin are examining this fish that is adapted to the sky clouds. And then you just see, in the back of one of the panels, Luffy walking away with it. And then the next panel, it has Sanji saying, oh, I sautéed it. And then Luffy's eating it. It's like, this is the best thing ever. And Nami's like, we haven't finished examining that. A lot of the humour in this chapter kind of happened a little bit in the background, such as when Usopp passes out and they say, oh, give him mouth to mouth. And Sanji's like... Yes, I'll give Nami mouth to mouth and Zoro calls him an idiot. And then in the next panel, you can see Sanji and Zoro kind of in the background of what's going on. And Sanji saying, did you just call me an idiot? And Zoro saying, I forget. You know, I really pay attention to what happens in the background now because a lot of the humour comes from the background scenes and the background characters doing things. So I freaking love that. It's, oh God, again, like every single time I start a new arc, I'm like, I'm so happy I'm reading One Piece again. Oh, and I'm so excited to say them get to Skype here. Like this whole vast cloud ocean is, again, I've never seen anything like that in fiction. I don't think, at least I don't think I have. So it's so imaginative and it's, Oh, the adventure, the adventure there. Just like at the start of the giant arc with the shipwreck and stuff, I was like, this is so adventurous. And yeah, again, like it's, ah, it's one piece. Of course I'm gonna love it. Well, not all Straw Hats entering Skypea illegally. Our Straw Hats are criminals, who knew? Firstly, it was nice to get to know Ganfor a little bit. He seemed to be quite, well, what's odd is that these people in the sky seem to ask for a lot of money. And then when they realise that the Straw Hats have no money, they still let them do what they want. And I find that so interesting and weird. I wonder if people in Skype here are the same way, but actually it has come back to bite them a little bit because yeah, there is like this angel at Heaven's Gate, it's called, in order to get to Skype here. And she asks for like a billion, what is it called, x falls? Yeah, one billion x tolls. And it's funny as well, because she has a camera, she's like, are you Taurus or have you come to make war? If you want to go to the upper stratum, you'll have to pay the entrance fee of one billion x tolls per person. Per person? Shit, I missed the per person part. So that would have been like 7 billion. Wow. I don't even know how much that is in like berries. I don't know if that's a lot of money or not, but I'll probably find out. So it does seem like the people in the sky, which it was interesting to find out about as well, that it's so far up as well. 23,000 feet above the blue sea. And there is another white, white sea, the upper stratum, 33,000 feet above that as well. <laughs> it's so funny because they're all feeling like quite sluggish and it's because the air in the atmosphere is a lot thinner up there, of course. And then in the next panel, they're like, okay, starting to get used to it. Yeah, I'm feeling a lot better too. And Ganfo's like, what? No, that's impossible. <laughs> Nothing is impossible to our Straw Hats. Didn't mention as well, but the Straw Hats were attacked by somebody in a mask in the previous chapter and Ganfo did save them from him. So it seems like there are these masked people in the sky that can attack them at any time. So he's given them a whistle that they can only use the once, I think. And if they ever need him, he will come. It's funny as well because Luffy was about to use it <laughs> like straight away and it took Nami to stop him. Speaking of Nami, it was funny when Ganfo told them that there are many ways up into Sky Pier and into the Sky Islands and he wasn't sure how they got there and he said, wow, the upstream, that's like the most risky one. And Nami's like, we didn't even have to do the upstream. It's kind of like breaking in somewhere where the door's already open kind of thing. So of course they went the most dangerous route, which I honestly am grateful for. I feel like if they went any other route, it wouldn't have been as good. The waterfall in the clouds too, oh, just so stunning. And now I wonder if the Straw Hats will get some kind of penalty for entering illegally. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. There is somebody sewing something outside, so I apologize if you end up hearing it. I also have to remember that I have a coffee and I don't want it to go cold. I do absolutely love how welcoming Sky Pia seems so far, but there's always that kind of question of, Sometimes looks can be deceiving. And with the whole kind of angel aspect of it as well, and it being sort of like a heavenly kind of place, it also feels a little bit sinister. There's like kind of this feeling inside of my heart that's like, hang on, there's just mm, something not quite right. And I think it was in a previous chapter when Sorrow said something like, we could already be dead. And it's that idea of like heaven, angels. It's odd, it's very odd. But it seems like such a, as it says, like a heavenly place. The island's foundation seems to be a cloud. It's so soft, they can jump, they can bounce. It sounds so fun, but I feel like that's lulling them into a false sense of security. But we did meet Cornus or Connus and Sue, her cloud fox, which, oh, so cute. 
I hope there are more cloud creatures on this island, but at the same time I don't, because I don't think my heart could handle it, in all honesty. Like, I thought Chopper was cute when we first met him, but this cloud fox, oh, oh my god, it looks so soft and cute. We've just met Connors' dad, who's using a waiver, which is some, like, kind of boat device that runs without, you know, the wind, and it has a dial. We ended the chapter with Connors revealing, have you not heard of a dial? and dun dun dun. So I mean, that's not like the biggest cliffhanger or anything, but it'll be interesting to see what they can learn from this place and can take on their adventure going forward. And it does seem like such a grand and incredible place. So I'm excited to explore it. And I appreciate the fact that this chapter was a little bit of a breather chapter, even for the Straw Hats. Even Chopper hasn't seen a beach before. And he's like, what, this is a beach? And to see them kind of enjoying themselves, it's a little bit freeing. And it also reminds me of what they're kind of missing out on doing this whole adventure, which like they're getting lots out of it. Don't get me wrong. They're achieving their dreams and they're getting towards their goals. But like at the same time, they do miss out on a lot of regular, normal things like having a beach vacation, for example. So it's kind of nice to say that. It's nice to see them do things that are rather normal in this very abnormal world. But seeing Skype here for the first time in this spread, it's so fantastic. The seafood extravaganza at the end there really made me crave some sushi. So I think I might order some. <laughs> Find out more about Sky Pier, especially with it being Land of the Gods, apparently, and Godland, it's referred to. But also the technology that works there, the kind of systems that they have in place, is so fascinating to find out about. It's like its own world. Like, we already have Order's One Piece world, and then we have, like, an extension of that. It feels like there are worlds within worlds. Yes, I'm paying attention to you, don't worry. So it was fascinating to find out more about the dials. Like the dials, some of them can record sound. The dials that are on these wafer board things can hold wind inside of it, or like it can process wind, for example, for 30 minutes, and then it can dispel wind for 30 minutes so that it can power the wavers. And Nami is fantastic on a waver. Luffy cannot drive it. He's too chaotic for that and Nami can, and Luffy is pissed. Luffy is so sad that he can't drive it, but Nami can. And I love the fact that Nami really took control of it. And she was like, yeah, this is actually kind of easy. And she loves it so much. And I'm not surprised, Nami is a fantastic navigator, so of course she can navigate this waiver. It's absolutely, hiya, booty man. Are you watching daddy work? <laughs> so it was just like a really fascinating chapter learning more about Skypea. And then I don't know why they didn't tell him this to begin with, especially when Nami got on that waiver thing, that there is a land that they're not allowed to go to. Like nobody's allowed to go there. And at the end of the chapter, Nami has found it because of course she has. What was it called again? You're distracting me. The Upper Yard, the Domain of the Kami. Yeah, in Skypea there is one place you must never go no matter what. It's like, why didn't they like tell her like, oh, don't stray too far because there's a land that nobody's allowed to go to but they didn't do that. And when Nami arrives there as well, there is actual ground because in Skypea there are, uh, I think it was like a cloud sea, cloud islands, like they're different kinds of clouds and they make up this world. And Nami's come across somewhere that has actual ground. So that's interesting. Like I wonder what the domain of the Kami means. Do you know what it means? Cause I don't. So the real question is, do I order sushi? Once I finish this volume, I think I will reward myself with some sushi. I think I deserve it. Okay, the honeymoon's over. The honeymoon is already over. Now the straw hats are definitely in trouble. Nami almost getting to the upper yard and approaching this forbidden land and seeing this whole commotion on this island, there's a guy running away from what appears to be four really strange men. There are huge dogs. In fact, the trees don't even have tops to them. That's that big. And it's so intimidating and scary. And that's apparently where like God resides. Naively, I think it's Luffy or Robin who asked about, oh, well, God's quite nice, right? He let us go. But it seems like, well, the escapee who tries to get away from them gets struck by lightning. So like, oh, that's like really scary. It seems like God's might and God's power is incredibly strong. And especially with the whole like heaven, angels, God, it's like, this actually like scares me to no end. I'm quite well, not scared of religion, but I do find some parts of religion quite scary, especially to do with judgment. So to see this happen in parallel with the Skypea police, I think they're called the White Berets, and they are, you know, striking down on the seven illegal trespassers who these four 
people who struck that man who tried to get away from the upper yard seem to know about they seem to know about these seven trespassers and they're like oh well that's bad because how are we going to split seven heads between four people and i'm just like are you okay? At the minute, I don't know what's... Well, I know what's scary. Yeah. These four guys are, like, very, very scary. They're definitely scarier than the police. I think it's Captain McKinley, who is leading the White Berets. Like, obviously, that's bad for the Straw Hats. But, like, splitting seven heads between four people is kind of making me think how the four men on this Forbidden Island are a lot scarier. And I felt so scared for Nami as well because she was on that wave by herself. She had somebody approaching her. She had to try and get away. That was very scary with Nami being by herself. I mean, I knew that she would get away. I knew that she had it in her because she is Nami. But my heart was in my mouth for a little bit of that. I was like, crap, she's been separated from the other straw hats. What if she gets captured? Anything could happen. So it was really spooky. Yeah, it was really spooky to see that person try to escape these four guys only to end up getting struck by lightning. Like, that is just... Oh, I'm dreading what's coming next. Ah, crap. They've really pissed off the law enforcement in Skype here now. <laughs> though I'm not surprised. That fine is ridiculous, though. Like, even I would have been like Nami. I would have hit one of them with that waiver myself. It did make Nami lose her for a second, even though she was like, please don't piss them off. Don't make them angry and stuff. And then she ended up like literally physically abusing one of them when she found out how much she would have to pay. So obviously that's like true to Nami because like how dare they demand money off Nami. Like she worked hard for her coin. Although I'm surprised that they only had 50,000 berries left. However, they did say that was because they had to feed Luffy, which of course would cost a lot of money. He's seen that guy eat. The White Berets, Captain McKinley wanted to exile them to the Sky Clouds, or at least exile to the clouds, which they think that 200 year old ship that fell from the sky in the previous arc, that's probably what happened to them. They got exiled to the clouds and that's why they dropped. So it really is a death sentence. It sounds awful, even though Luffy's like, oh, that sounds nice. But I really like Cornus. I'm saying her name wrong, I think. I definitely like Cornus and I like that she is trying to help them. And even her dad too. Like they are so friendly, so nice. And apparently the only allies that they have in Skype here at the minute, they are in deep shit now. And Captain McKinley is saying the commies vassals in the upper yard will deal with you. Uh, so I want to explore Skype here more, but it seems like they're not really going to be able to get inside Skype here or explore too much of it beyond that beach that they're at. Instead, I think they're kind of running away to the upper yard, which sounds so terrifying. Uh, again, like, I'm scared, but at the same time, I love scary things, so that should be interesting. But yeah, this chapter just mainly dealt with the fact that the Straw Hats are now criminals in Skype here. And they've been there, what, five chapters? Like, <laughs> of course. <laughs> there are, like, five chapters left of this volume, and then I can order sushi. And above them in the upper yard, Kami Inuru awaits. Oh, this is so fucking exciting! I absolutely adore the fact that we are having this kind of narrative right now where Nami, Robin, Chopper and Zoro are on the ship that have been taken away by the Lobster Express who works for Kami and there are these like man-eating fish all over the place and then we have Usopp, Luffy and Sanji are still on the island and they have been left behind as their friends have been taken away to the sacrificial altar and they're being told that the people who are being tested are actually Luffy, Usopp, and Sanji. They're the ones that are being tested. So this is heaven's judgment. Terrifying, honestly. Like, that whole idea of it just sends a shiver down my spine. You really feel the gravity of the situation of how, like, split the Straw Hats are in what's happening. Like, they want to leave, but at the same time, some of them kind of don't. They just got there, essentially, but Nami's like hey, like, our lives are in danger. Yeah, we've got to leave. And it was funny when Luffy was like, don't you talk crazy. What's more important, your life or adventure? And then Nami's like, my life. And then after that, it's money. And then Sanji's like, am I after that? It's it's great. Even in the face of danger, they will still find their sense of humour. So essentially, this is just getting, like, so exciting. Like, way more exciting. And I feel like it's a bit different to the Jaya arc because I feel like the Jaya arc started off exciting and then I mean I still enjoyed the Jaya arc don't get me wrong but it felt yeah like a lot of people told me in the comments it was kind of building things up it was giving you things that are going to be relevant in the future so it was a lot of setup whereas this one I feel like we got like a slow build of an adventure to begin with getting into Skype here and now it's like boom 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 we have the full-on exciting fast-paced action and adventure so I love the different way that it's a 
approaching this arc compared to the previous arc. It like my straw had to be split up. Like it's so scary. It's exciting but scary. They say it's all part of heaven's punishment. Criminals either become sacrificial offerings or they undergo a challenge. And I'm like, what do they have to do to keep their lives? What do they have to do to escape? And I love things with sort of trials and competitions and all of that. So it feels like that's where we're headed. In order to save their lives, they have to undergo a certain test or something that's going to push them to their limits. Whew, right, there is so much to process with this bloody chapter. Freaking out, Cornus, really? Oh gosh, I mean, at the same time though, see, this is what I mean, right? So in the previous arc, I mentioned something about the guy who ended up helping them on the island, Norland's ancestor, Cricket. So I was like, I can't, look who's decided to join. This is, this is Tobu. He's very camera shy. He doesn't ever really get on the camera. So I didn't trust Cricket because he seemed overtly nice and overtly helpful in the giant arc. And I was like, I don't know if I trust him because I mean, I totally get his motives for helping and stuff. And there are some genuinely nice people in the world. But then we come across Cornus and her dad. And what is really interesting though, is that I think they're not evil. They're not, I, they're definitely not evil. They're not bad people, especially since Luffy noticed that Cornus was shaking since leaving the house. And Cornus revealed that she's the one who summoned the Lobster Express, which took, you know, Nami, Robin, Chopper, and Zoro to the upper yard. So like she betrayed them, but at the same time, if she didn't do that, she would get killed. And that is the kind of culture that is here in Skypiea. You have to follow this certain person, the, the Kami, or you die. And I love the kind of exploration of that because it ties in a lot with having this faith in a higher being and the kind of effects that has on a community or an entire island of people and the things that they will do. And it's scary to be amongst that. It really, really is. And I think with like Luffy and the gang, they, uh, <laughs> they're not fit to be by themselves in this whole mess. And even though Connors, I, f I feel like I'm pronouncing her name so many different ways. She obviously didn't want to do it. Like she liked them and even they were like, you shouldn't have told us that because now you're in danger kind of thing. And she is in danger. She has gotten like some kind of comeuppance for kind of, well, she's done what she was supposed to do as her honor or like she was duty bound to betray them, but by telling them, and you know, we are in Skypea, we are in the actual city, and I was worried that we wouldn't actually get to see it, but we did, and it looks amazing, it really does. But again, it's scary because every single person in there seems to be a little bit different, a little bit weird, and the way that they are coming across as they are avoiding them, and they are looking at them suspiciously, and you just know something is not right. And even Cornish, like she is, shaking. She knows that nothing is right right now and she is in danger. And the Straw Hats have realised that too. And they berate her for telling them the truth because they can see, or at least I feel like they can see the gravity of the situation and what Cornus has done. Even though she did betray them, they're still like, now you're going to be in even worse trouble because you've told us. And then we did have Ganfo. He came and saved the day, essentially. And they are on their way still to the sacrificial place. And it was really great to see Ganfo come back and help. But yeah, it, it's a really scary place. Like, I wanted to explore it, but now I'm like, get the hell out. Get the hell out of there now. But I was so shocked when Cornus revealed that she had betrayed them. It was shocking. And <laughs> this is why I can't trust people and their good intentions in the One Piece series just at face value. I really can't. But at the same time, I love that it's not just black and white. I love that it's actually a lot more complex than her just betraying them because a lot is at stake here. He's back. Ash is back. You always change your mind about why you want to lie, don't you? Okay, so Luffy, Usopp, Sanji have entered the upper yard and it's really quite scary. There are these swinging mask things that are quite huge. And at least they're on their way. They're on their way. However, Nami, Robin, and Zoro have left the ship from the sacrificial altar. And Chopper is now in charge of looking after the ship while they're gone. And poor Chopper, he didn't realise until the very last minute that he's by himself. And he's probably in the most danger of all of them. Love that for him. And I love the fact that Nami wasn't going to go until Robin said, oh, they're going to be like jewels and stuff. And then Nami was like, let's go. Let's find history, which obviously she just cares about the money. But I already love the fact that Robin knows Nami well enough to be able to like manipulate her in that way. Like not manipulate as in like really badly manipulate, like not in a bad way, but like she can 
like she knows the straw hats she knows their like strengths and weaknesses and things and she knows what will get them to kind of do things like she knows her personality you know and i'm not saying it's a bad thing it's really not but robin has been able to incorporate herself into the straw hat so well so far and i'm still just in awe of her but yeah not a whole lot to say about this chapter i was really just you know setting things up for this adventure in like getting them to almost cross paths with one another we know where each of them are headed i also know ash is headed for the litter trip and i think he might be having a shit oh and i love the fact that the kami are kind of you bring in this game to it. We had the Straw Hats arrive at these four different kind of tunnels. And one was Challenge of the Swamp, Challenge of the Iron, Challenge of the String, and Challenge of the Ball. And they can only choose one. And it's like, well, what are they going to do? Like, it seems like such a sinister kind of game that they're going to be playing. And it brings some fun to it, honestly. It brings some fun into, like, the really creepiness and eeriness of it all. I'm excited to see what challenge they end up picking and what the challenges entail. Okay, they ended up picking the challenge of the ball and I feel like no matter what they chose, they would have been fucked. We do meet Satori, who was one of the four guys earlier on when Nomi arrived at the island and saw them chasing a guy. And at the start of the chapter as well, it was quite sinister having this kind of panel page with each of the four of them. I think they're called Kami's vassals. So it's kind of scary to see them in this way. And they do serve the omnipotent Kami Anuru. So I'm really scared, but also excited to meet this Kami person. But like, if they're omnipotent, I, it's, um, it's hard that, isn't it? Because I'm like, does an actual Kami exist? Or is this just like an idea? They obviously worship this Kami. I don't know what's going on. I'm always wary talking about things that kind of parallel religion in a way. Well, this is the forbidden sacred land that they've entered into and they have to pass the challenge of the ball. But in order to do that, they have to beat this guy up, Satori. And he seems like quite a formidable foe as well. Luffy tries to land a punch, misses. Sanji tries to beat him as well, but he gets his moves anticipated so he doesn't get to even touch him. It looks like it's not gonna be easy. And the ship is already sailing away too. And if they don't get on the ship, they'll never find the sacrificial altar. So it's not gonna be shit for them them, not gonna lie. My theory is they will have to pass all four of the challenges before they can get to the sacrificial altar and that might be a bit time consuming for them but yeah that's the challenge they chose. Looking forward to seeing what the challenge of the ball actually entails other than trying to beat his ass and there are like these giant balls as well. <laughs> There are these giant balls that when they've touched them they've exploded and you don't know what you're gonna get with each ball so yeah. Yeah, it was good. And I finished volume 26. I am now on volume 27. And it has each of the guys on the front there as well. Each of the vassals. Vessel? They're not... It isn't spelled vessels, so I don't think they're vessels. But vassals. It's a great cover. Mm -mm -mm. I am so full now. I did end up getting my sushi. It's been a couple of hours since the last update. I had a little bit of a break. Let the camera charge. I am satisfied. I was also satisfied with chapter 247 of this book. It deals more with Sanji, Luffy and Usopp still battling the guy with the balls. I believe his name was Satori. And yeah, he's knocked Sanji out, which is really shit. Especially considering Luffy and Usopp are a little bit useless, not gonna lie. Even Sanji was like, are you guys done monkeying around? And then Sanji ends up getting it. So even though Satori seems like a bit of a random bad guy and a bit of a random foe, he's quite formidable actually. And I don't know how they're getting out of it. I don't really know the other guy's names, but I believe one of them has come down at the end to get the sacrifices and realizes there's only one, Chopper. And Chopper is still on the ship by himself. And we did get like a little flashback to when they decided to leave the whistle on the ship. So it's hilarious that Chopper's like, I'll hang on to this. If there's an emergency, the Sky Knight will save us. And then straight away he's blown that whistle as soon as one of those guys, and he's got some kind of wings on his back. It reminds me of those giants with wings that we saw very briefly in the Jaya arc in the ocean. And I don't know if that's like connected. I don't know if they're the same people. I mean, they're not giants there, but who knows? Maybe they become giants when they are below the Sky Island. Okay, I'm starting to get this world a little bit now, like the rules of the world, people's roles in, Sky Pier and stuff like that. So it seems like Kami and Naru is a, well, the Kami is itself, I think, like a king or god, and then Naru is just like the name of that person who's fulfilled that role or something like that, because Ganfo, the Sky Knight, apparently used to be the Kami. So this Naru being, person, whoever it is, is fulfilling that godlike role 
in Skypea. So it's interesting that we found that out about Ganfoy. That's a nice little like twist for his character. It also adds some gravitas to him being there too and helping the Straw Hats because he does come and tries to help Chopper but he got like blasted away so I feel like he's in trouble and Chopper does try and defend the ship like he's main priority is to defend the ship. That's what he was tasked to do. So he's trying his best. And even Ganfo is saying, the sacred land will sing once more. I believe this with all my heart. So like the song of the island is when this war with Skypea, or this war inside Skypea will end. Because, I mean, of course there's a war. Of course there's like battles going on and stuff. But when it ends, we will get a song. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm getting from this chapter anyway. What I love though was when Ganfo was talking to Connus about the Straw Hats being criminals and what deems them criminals. Because he says, perhaps outsiders is a better term in every realm there are those who refuse to play by the rules. Right now, are you any different from them? Which he says to Connors. It's all a matter of perspective. Those whose actions make them heroes in times of war might under other circumstances be branded as murderers. So I really like that whole message about perspective and like seeing people as different. And I feel like it, definitely resonates with Connors, especially since what she's just done. You would think that she betrayed the Kami and she's like betrayed her country essentially by what she's done. Or at least that's the kind of way that it's being portrayed to her. And I like that Ganfo was giving her that perspective. This chapter was called Former Kami versus Vassal. So Ganfo does fight one of the vassals. He is called Skyrider Shura. And the things he says to Chopper as well was quite terrifying. You don't want me to attack your comrades, you don't want me to destroy your ship, and you don't want to die. You don't leave me with a lot of options. But he does give us some very good insight into, again, like the rules of this world, the rules of Skypea, about how the sacrificial altar is not part of any domain. So targets, people, sacrifices, there are four areas, each ruled by a different vassal. When a target sets foot on one of those areas, the other vassals cannot touch him. That is the rule but the sacrificial altar is not part of any domain. Targets in this free area are considered fair game. But to get there, they'd have to survive the challenges, which is exactly what our Luffy, Usopp and Sanji are doing, or at least trying to do. It looks like a death blow for the Sky Knight, but I don't believe, I never believe when somebody dies anymore. I really don't. Well, he's been stabbed and it doesn't look pretty. So I can only imagine he's like dying. It would be cool if he did die because it feels like he is a little bit of a scapegoat, I guess. And especially for Chopper calling him and he has saved them a couple of, well, I think three times now he's saved them. So it's probably good that he is out of the way so that we can just focus on the straw hats and, and stuff like that. But it was interesting to meet him, especially to learn more about the, like the role of the Kami. And apparently, he was usurped by this Anura person. I'm so intrigued by him. It's like Crocodile, isn't it? When we finally got to meet Crocodile, Mr. Zero. And this is what it feels like, especially how much power this person has on the these people, these vassals as well. He's saying Enaru is all powerful. You'll never reach his heights. Look, that just feels like crazy talk. So Chopper's watching this battle happen. What has Nami seen? Because she is on like the lookout on top of this tree thing. And she says something and she says this island, no way. And the others are asking her, well Zoro and Robin are asking her, what have you seen? So like, what has she seen? Oh, uh, also we do have, what would you call them? A kind of a little bit like with Alabaster, there were like different factions as part of this war. And here we have these Shandian warriors. We just met Wiper and they're saying that anyone who rules under the title Kami and their followers are their sworn enemies. So it feels like we have different groups of people at war here, just like in Alabaster. Oh, we met a Shandian called Asa, I think is how it's pronounced. And we are in this like little hidden village in the clouds, which is so cute. And Asa seems like a very formidable child. It looks like Wiper is in charge of this maybe slight rebellion. It is feeling a little bit Alabaster at the minute. Oh yay, they're kind of beating that guy's ass. I keep forgetting his name. It begins with an S, Satori. Probably pronouncing it wrong. Yeah, there was this really cool ball dragon moment that they do end up pretty easily defeating, but it was still a really cool moment. And it meant that they could get the upper hand on Satori while Usopp is looking for the exit and he's found it. So it seems like this ball challenge, they bought it in the bag. Meanwhile, we still haven't found out what Nami was looking at. But back with Chopper for a second as well, he jumped in after Ganfo. Paul Pierre, I think, got slashed and hacked and also fell into like the sky ocean. Oh, 
when he says join your master, oh, poor Pierre just like falls into the sea. That's so sad. But I wouldn't be surprised if all of them survived. Ah, Norland was right. And part of the island didn't sink to the bottom of the sea, it floated. And we have a part of Jaya in the sky. The missing Jaya was floating in the sky. That's so cool. I love the way that really slowly unfolded. And you know, we had that Nami saying something and she couldn't believe it. But we also had like a little bit of a flashback to Jaya when they say half of the house. And it, you know, when they arrive at Crickets and there is sort of a, a plywood fake house thing, the landmass was torn away and the floating island was part of Jaya. That's so cool. And how they found it weird that there was a second story but no stairs, yeah. Like what happened? Where did it go? So I love the way that it tied back to Noland, the liar, who is apparently not a liar. But yeah, the Shantians are gearing up for war as well. We have Raki, Braham, Kamikari, Gembo. They're on their way to Kami's temple, the false god that has like kind of taken this throne and the people are praying to and stuff. So that's a really good commentary on a lot of things. A lot of things I don't really want to talk about. <laughs> a little intimidating to talk about, I'm not gonna lie. Usopp, Luffy and Sanji are now back on the boat and they are making their way out of the Forest of No Return. It was really funny as well when they all connected themselves to Usopp and he got like bashed around and they were all like nearly dead anyway. And it's like, didn't make it any better for them. That was funny. But it does feel like Alabasta were gearing up for this war against somebody who's placed themselves in a position of power. And that feels like Crocodile in Alabaster. And we had different factions in different parts of the country, you know, about to come together for this, this war. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about that, but I'm sure it will take a different turn. Okay, we are back on the adventure train. Chew, fucking chew. I am so glad they're all back together again. Oh my God, I teared up a little bit as well with Chopper. Like, bless him. He was like, no, nothing scary happening. He's crying his eyes out. But then Usopp says the mass has been kind of destroyed. And Chopper is like, I couldn't stop him. I'm so sorry. But Usopp is like, a mass can always be replaced, but we can't replace you. <laughs> Oh, I honestly love it when they all get back together. Like, this is why I love when they get split up because when they come back together, it is the sweetest thing. It is the thing that I look forward to and it always is an incredible reunion. I love this panel here with each of these straw hats and them being like so invested in this adventure as well. And you know, there's a city of gold that is on the other end of this rainbow that they're gonna try and find now. And even Robin's like, hee hee, it sounds like fun. I'm like, Robin, I love you. Zoro, we're in enemy territory and vastly outnumbered. Those are my kinds of odds. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. I freaking love it. They're all back together again. They've already completed one challenge. They already took one of the vassals down. The Sky Knight seems to be pretty okay. Chopper's helping them heal. We also had a run-in with the, I think they're the gorillas. I think that's what they're calling themselves. The Shandians also have a run-in with Luffy, Usopp and Sanji and there's a little bit of conflict between them and Wiper seems to be making an enemy of them. He isn't really gonna let them just stay in Sky Pierce scot-free. So there's just a lot of conflict going on in all honesty. I'm trying to keep my head wrapped around everything that's going on. I don't think I'm struggling. I, I know people's places in what's happening right now. But yeah, there's a lot of different factors at play here, which is always really exciting. And it means that just so much is, you know, gonna come and it's gonna be an incredible journey. I just know it. But yeah, I'm excited for the City of Gold adventure thing now. Now this is what I've signed up for. And Nolan's story is getting even more cool. The fact that they can put the map together and it's the skull, like the ancient map of Skypea with the map of Jaya and like the, the shape of it is a skull and Nolan's story about the gold being in the skull's right eye. Like, could this be any more piratey? I love it. This is how I imagine pirates and the goal for adventure and gold and oh yeah, like the whole map thing. Oh, why do I love maps so much? And the most interesting thing as well is that the Shandia, they want the land to return to where it came. And I think the Shandia, it hasn't really been explained just yet, it probably will explain everything a lot more. But it seems like maybe the Shandia were the ones who were like part of this land when it got blasted up and have just like lived there ever since. And obviously like the descendants and things from like the 400 years that have passed are still living there today, which would explain a lot of like why they are in this war at the minute. The Straw Hats are really just catching up, getting up to speed with the plan. And they're just gearing up now to go to 
the place on the map, the, the skull's right eye. There was a funny moment with Sanji asking Zoro to use his swords to help heat up the food. That was funny because Zoro was like, it's not what these swords are for. But also the whole bonfire thing as well, when Robin's like, we should really put the bonfire out so our enemies don't know we're here. But they're like, you have to have a bonfire. Like, that's just the rule. And then even Zoro and Sanji have like, got this huge bonfire thing. And then they're just having this big bonfire. And even like the wolves that are nearby are dancing with them. It's just like, oh, it's... It's funny, like there's a lot of ironic humor in this. Oop, okay, way back in our room and he isn't wearing a shirt. <laughs> like I was expecting something totally different. We were building up to this kind of godlike presence or some kind of, I guess a deity who is this, like they said, this omnipotent person. And we get a shirtless guy who looks a little bit like Eminem. And I mean, I'm not hating it. I do miss Ace, so I guess, you know, we have someone who's like filling this appearance role right now with the whole shirtless look. But yeah, not what I was expecting. Not what I was expecting. The vassals are all kind of coming together as well. And the Inaru is telling them, you look, everything's fair game now. So even if someone's in other domains, you know, like before you weren't allowed to touch them, but now you can. Like he's making this really scary game with the straw hats and he's like all bets are off anything can happen now that he kind of knows that the straw hats are after the gold yeah he's gonna protect it with everything he has luffy zoro robin and chopper are gonna go after the gold while sanji nami and usopp are gonna stay on the ship and navigate it around the island so we do have another case of them splitting up but they kind of have to at the minute but also who the hell repaired the ship who the hell repaired that mast because even Usopp was like, they restored it to the way it used to be. And like, who had knowledge of that? I don't even have a theory for who that is. But that was really strange. That was like a really strange moment. It was a little spooky when Usopp in the middle of the night wanted to take a piss and he ended up coming across somebody in the mist fixing the ship and passing out. So it's strange, it's really bizarre. And I can't put my finger on who that was. I hope I find out in this arc. I hope I don't have to wait like a thousand chapters before I find out who it is. But no, I feel like this might be one of the last chapters before we head off to this gold. So of course we had to kind of do a little bit of recon and take this moment to refresh. Ah, right, okay. I'm glad this chapter happened because it gave me a lot of insight into the Shandians and how it's quite different to Alabaster. And the Shandians are actually like the native people of the upper yard. And so it's rightfully their land. And you have like these false gods, false prophets or whatever, the Kami overtaking it and taking land off them. So of course they're going to fight back. Of course they're going to want their land back. And it's a great commentary on that so far. I don't know how it turns out, but I do feel like having this whole storyline and stuff is like a great sort of holding up the mirror to society. Hey, this was their land, give it them back. Also with the Straw Hats, well, at least Usopp learning about this and seeing, oh, so they're not the bad guys. Like you guys are the Kami are the bad guys. You took their land and that's a great thing to explore, I think. So it'll be really interesting to see how it turns out. Obviously the Shanians are on the offensive. So even though they did attack our Straw Hats, it's a really complicated and complex web, essentially. What's going on is very complex. And I just thought, oh, it's just another, you know, fighting for land, people rebelling against the false god and stuff like that. I thought that's what it was gonna be. And part of it kind of is, but I'm really glad I got more insight into the Shandians, their story. And yeah, of course they want it back. I, I'm rooting for them. But it'll be interesting to see how it conflicts with the Straw Hats and the Kami, how that all unfolds. In this chapter, we do just have them continue in their journey towards this gold. But mainly the fact that the Bloody Beads split up again. So Luffy, Zoro, Robin and Chopper have all been split up, even though they just split up from the others. <laughs> so it's like... Oh, and then Zoro's so hilarious. He's like, it's the right eye, so you have to go right. But like, right where? Like, you're not making sense. And then now he's split up by himself. He's like, I have the map memorized. I know the way. I go right. Zoro is like one of the smarter ones in the Straw Hats. But I just love the fact that sometimes we have these moments where these characters aren't always as smart as they usually are. And it's just like, it's ironic. It's great. It adds so much to the, the joke. And I like the fact that we had that running joke in this chapter with the whole right 
light thing in Zora, which sounds like such a mundane thing as I'm speaking it out loud, but I just love those little touches of humour and the way it informs the character. So it'll be interesting to see how they progress. There was this big huge snake thing as well, which was quite terrifying. But yeah, it was great for me to open my eyes more to the Shandians and to figure out more about the Skypiea lore. So volume 27 is complete and now I am on volume 28. Wiper is quite the formidable fighter. He ended up taking down Shura and we have this kind of like numbers game as well to see who will be left standing at the end of this. So with all of Anura's men, there was like 81 and Wiper has knocked one of them down now, who, the one who does the string challenge. So it's now down to 80. And even Anura has predicted that only five will be left standing. And it really is a sinister thing that Anura does with him kind of treating his people like a game and this whole thing like a game. It's kind of sadistic in a way, but also like, kind of fun. <laughs> there wasn't any sign of the straw hats in this chapter, which is fine. There was a bit of a flashback to begin with, with Gonfor and the Shandians and him trying to broker peace between them, like the Skypea people and the Shandians. So Ganfo has tried to reach out to them in the past, so that's quite good, but still, it's still their land, so you know what I mean? But at least it means that Ganfo isn't somebody who's completely ignorant to the fact that they've taken over their land or anything like that. He has actually tried in the past to reach out. So we just need to say if like Wiper is open to discussion because at the minute he seems to be on a bit of a rampage. He's even like, leave all fallen behind. We don't have time for them. I see what he's doing and it's important, but like he isn't treating his own people right, you know? And that poor young girl, I think her name was Asa. In the flashback, it seems that she can sense trouble and she wanted some kind of treasure from the upper yard. And Raki, I think it's pronounced, I haven't mentioned her yet, but she is one of the Shandians. She wanted to get some like treasure back for her and she has like her little treasure bag and he just like throws it away. It's like he's not really being the best leader right now. He seems to be ignoring his people in order to get his ultimate goal. And I feel like that's gonna bite him in the ass. Ah, bugger. Luffy and Wiper have run into each other again. The thing is though, I don't know how that's gonna play out. It could be bad for both of them. This chapter was mainly dealing with trying to explain dials a bit more, and I do understand them more. Now the power of something like the Skypeans and the vassals in particular have been revealed, so like the impact dial, the impact dial it can absorb an impact and then the user can then reverse that impact back onto the other person and it can be like really, really dangerous and all of that. So that was really cool to look at and to kind of explain their powers. Mantra was kind of explained as well a little bit, but even Ganfo doesn't even know how Mantra works. But it's essentially kind of like listening to the voices inside of someone's body or something. And the vassals can do that within the upper yard and the Kami can do that for the entire country. But even to Gonfo, he, he can't explain it that well because even he doesn't really know about that power. But at least I'm kind of taking it in. I kind of do understand a little bit of how they're doing what they're doing. What's a little bit sadistic as well is that Inaru is kind of just laughing when he finds out that another one of his vassals has been taken down. Like, he just doesn't seem to care. He's like, oh, well, they didn't have the divine protection of the Kami. And it's like, that's your man. That's your man that's just been taken down. But he's just sitting there laughing. Like, the whole thing is a game to him. The whole thing is like a joke. But I'm wondering how serious it'll get because I don't think he's just gonna laugh at everything. Like, something major's gonna happen. And now that Luffy and Wiper are together and like have crossed paths. I'm a little bit worried for both of them. Catching up with our gold team or the straw hat sort of trying to find the gold. Chopper is running away and Robin is the only person who has actually come across something worthwhile and of course because it's Robin she's obviously using her intellect and her talents to find some ruins. She's the only one as well to like quickly defeat her enemy too. She's confronted with someone. And I love how Robin was like really protective of the ruins and kind of like, do you know how important they are? Like respect history. And she ends up, you know, easily overcoming him because she's a queen. Zoro has come across Bra Braham, warrior Braham. And Luffy is facing off with Wiper. So yeah, not a whole lot to say about this chapter. Just things coming together and Robin's the only one who's on the right path. <laughs> Always surprised. Well, fuck her duck, it seems like Inoru is starting to take it seriously. Sanji, like he literally just incapacitated Sanji and he looks out for the count, shit. Especially since he's the one who's gonna be able to protect Nami and Usopp. I mean, they're gonna be fine, absolutely fine. I know they can fight themselves and 
go up against enemies. But like Sanjeev, Inari really went for the one who was like the most powerful fighting wise, you know? But yeah, this was a really tense standoff between Zoro and Braham. And it was so cool to see Zoro kind of learn a new trick as well with the whole like air slash thing and like weaponizing the air in order to like hurt him. That was so cool. It's so cool to see Zoro level up essentially. Like he's getting stronger and stronger and not be long before he gets to kick Hawkeye's ass. But also at the same time, I'm like, but Braham and Zoro are both like good. They are good. Like Braham is native to the area. So he's trying to get the land back and he's following Wiper's orders sort of thing. So he's not like a bad person, but obviously it's just, they're clashing at the minute. That's like kind of what the whole story is demanding of them. They've come to an impasse and, you know, Zoro was like, if somebody tells me I'm gonna die, I don't take it lying down. And so like, they have no option but to fight. But I'm really glad Zoro won, of course he won. And it was really cool to see Zoro try to learn Braham's techniques and stuff, especially since Braham had this whole light thing with his pistol and was like super quick. But no, Zoro was able to get a sense of his surroundings and defeat him. These dials are so cool. Also, the next chapter is called Pirate Luffy versus Berserker Wiper. So that's gonna be a really tough battle, I think. Who in the world have just gotten onto the ship? They're laughing. And it's after Inuvro has left and they're saying, ho, 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 is it Santa? No, there's two different people. We are having a lot of mysterious people appearing and us not getting a chance to know who they are straight away. It's very mysterious. Inaru was on the ship. He incapacitates Usopp as well very easily by just like kind of flicking him in the face and it looks painful. But he also reveals the real reason why the Inaru appeared there and usurped the previous Kami. And he reveals that they were looking for the city of gold themselves, the El Dorado. And it's apparently called Chandora. And that's essentially why Inaru is there. He doesn't really want to stay there. He doesn't want to stay in Sky Pier. Our Straw Hats are also looking for this place. We still continue with Luffy and Wiper. They are battling each other. I don't think the battle's over though. It looks far from over. And they both look equally beat up by the end of this chapter and they both gave each other as good as they get. Wiper isn't going to be taken down as easily as I think Braham was by Zoro. But also when will they say that they're on the same team? Again, like they're battling each other because they think they have to, but they need to be on the same page yet. And then everyone would be happier. Shit, Chopper and one of the vassals are going to fight. Hopefully he does come back swinging and stuff because I feel like Chopper has been a little bit more comic relief recently rather than an actual fighter. And I know he's got it in him. He has proven time and time again that he can defend himself and he can fight. Next chapter is called Pirate Chopper versus Vassal Gadatsu. So there is a fight coming. So I'm looking forward to seeing Chopper kick some butt. Wiper said something about his dial and if he uses it again, he'll be pulverized. Yeah, if I fire one more reject dial, my body will be pulverized. And he's saving it for Inaru. So I wonder if when he finally comes face to face with the Noru if he's going to try and use this dial on him and then also die because of it. And he's like going to sacrifice himself to do that. That would be really sad if that happens. But Luffy does end up falling through the ground and so he's not fighting Wiper anymore. And Luffy doesn't know where he is. I love the ruins and the derelict stuff. It's so good. Robin has also, you know, been finding out more about the place and she figured out the name of it too, that it's called Chandora. And she wonders if the secrets of the history of the, you know, like the, the down below world. And because like one of her biggest goals is to find out the history of the world and like the missing parts of it, she wonders if Chandora will open those doors for her. And I love that it ties in with her goal. You know, it's what drives her forward. And especially after we saw what happened at the start of the Jairoc, when she pleaded for Luffy to leave her where she was in Alabasta because she thought that she would never achieve her dream. We see her really determined and motivated to find out the history of this place because her dream is still alive thanks to Luffy. So I love the fact that Robin has this story for her. Oh, and the two laughing people who I thought was Santa is Satori's brothers. I think they're both boys. Oh yeah, they were triplets. And they just seem so weird and bizarre, honestly. And they're on the ship now. And Nami says, once in a while, I have to do the protecting too. So although I feel like in pretty much every arc, Nami has just proven time and time again that she is an incredible fighter and she can defeat 
the people in front of her. So I do love that Nami is going to really shine again and she'll have that opportunity to do. And Robin's about to fight someone as well. She's about to battle Yama. I think her name is. Uh, see, I knew Chopper would do it. I knew he had it in him. I, I mean, I think he's defeated Gadatsu. I, I'm sure he has. It wasn't explicitly stated at the end there, but it does look like Gadatsu has been KO'd and Chopper reigns supreme. It was a really good battle as well, actually. It was quite good. Chopper was observing. He realized that he had things on his feet that were helping him fly. And he changed his appearance and was just like, boom, boom, boom. So it was a very good fight, a very good chapter. Ganato was a little bit silly as well, though. Like, he ended up getting one of his old men and then Chopper was like, oh, well, why don't we team up and bring him down? But it was just Chopper who ended up taking him down. And the fact that Chopper keeps getting called in a raccoon, oh, bless him. One of these days, I'll realize he's a reindeer and not a raccoon. But no, it was a good fight. I don't really have any other thoughts on it. It was just a good fight. <laughs> Ew, they had farts in their scent dials? The dirty bastards. I'm talking about Hitori and Katori. Nami did manage to whoop their asses along with Ganfo, so that was great. Chopper did end up defeating Gadatsu, and he has like sunk down into his own swamp. So, I mean, he was still alive when he did it, so who knows, maybe he can come out the other side. But again, there was a 50% chance survival of it. He even said it himself. A lot of fighting going on at the minute. Seriously, like every chapter's been someone versus someone. And even the next one, Kamakiri versus Inaru is another fight. And Inaru in this chapter as well tells him, give it your best shot. I won't counter attack. I won't lift a finger for the next five minutes. You won't move an inch. On poor Robin as well, she's getting her ass kicked by... That lady, I can't remember her name now, but she's sitting down. She's got blood coming out of her mouth. And I'm sure there will be a chapter called Robin versus whoever this bitch is. But it's not looking good for Kamakiri in this next chapter. Because I don't think they're taking down Inaru. And there's usually been like a clear winner for each of these fights. Kamakiri, it's not looking good for you. Holy shit. Oh my god. And not just that, but I have like one bar of battery left on the camera. So this could die at any second. Just like fucking Kamakiri. Was he just obliterated there? Because it looked like he was. Because his glasses just fall. What happened? Oh my god. Literally, the electricity, the lightning completely took him out. But then the discharge also went through the Milky Road and got rid of 20 of his own men. And Inu was just like, don't give a shit. What is in his mind? He's just as crazy as Bellamy. So two hours into the survival game, which like, honestly, this is like, getting so freaking exciting. Uh, 81 fighters to start, 56 have fallen. Of the Kami's forces, 13 remain. Of the Shandians, seven still stand. And of the Straw Hat crew, five are left. So they must count Sanji and Usopp being totally KO'd as them out of the game. But the Shandians, they're going to wake up, right? The total number left standing is 25. And Inuro did say that five will only remain. And I hope to God it's our straw hats. I really do. Nami, Robin, Luffy, Zoro, and Chopper, I think, are the only five left. Oh, God. Like, this is so exciting, Lord. This is so cool. This is so cool. Oh, my God. Robin is seriously not winning her fight. The person Robin is fighting is called Yama. I had to go back and double check. But her name is Yama, and she is a force of nature. She's like a mountain. Robin is not able to get many hits in and just trying to get her away from like the hieroglyphs and the actual place where there is a lot of information for the history. And, you know, it's just so that she doesn't accidentally destroy it. And I love the part where Yama was like, I don't care about the past. And Robin was like, fools who don't respect the past are doomed to repeat it. And like, I just absolutely love how Robin is so defensive of the past, and, like how important it is and like, that is just, like, so great. I totally agree with her. And it's what is going to help her win this fight. I'm sure of it. But it's not looking good for her right now, I'm afraid. Come on, Robin, you can do it. And the fact that Kamakiri put a whole, like, spear through Inuru's head. His head. It actually went through his head. Look at that. It's actually through his head. And still nothing. He's still alive. He says, I am lightning. Since ancient times, men have always taken their fear of the unknown and called it an act of God. Anything they couldn't control was considered divine providence. I am that providence. Like, he really is acting like a god right now. And that is the most scariest thing of all. It's like, how do you defeat God? Although it's not explicitly saying that he is God. But that's kind of the, the vibe I'm getting from it. And he's like, I'm sorry I dozed off. Seriously, Kamakiri is giving his all. And he's just sitting there, taking it. He's just like, 
this is tis but a scratch tis, not even a scratch honestly like it hasn't even affected him one bit right this game is getting way too intense and only 25 left standing and five of them are the straw hearts and apparently only five will be left oh god but i also want the shandians to also come through too because they're defending their land oh also it was great to see connor's and her dad pagaya i think it's pronounced they've come back and they're on the ship they're helping nami and yeah it was so nice to see them again and to see that they are helping and there is progress being made trying to get them to escape the entire skype here so like they've got the escape route after all of this is said and done because when you're gearing up for this big blowout yoohoo big summer blowout oh my god it's gonna die okay right that the chapter was great okay it was great a great chapter the fight between robin and yama is over and robin won of course although i feel like i might have said yama was a woman in one of the previous chapters no yama's a man and robin kicked his ass okay I'm so embarrassed that I thought Yama was a woman. Oh my god. Robin is really serious about protecting history. Like, do not cross her. She will not forgive you if you dare smear it or destroy it. I'm a little bit scared of it. I'm still scared of her powers. Like, her powers are still so weird. All of those limbs and those hands coming out from the ground and stuff and pushing Yama over the edge of the cliff. It's, I mean, it's great. I was rooting for Robin, but it's still creepy. Like, I could still think it's creepy. <laughs> it was funny as well when Zoro was like trying to start a fight with this big bird. And he's like, yeah, you want to fight me, eh? <laughs> Poor bird. And the bird is just following Zoro. I mean, come on, Zoro. You could have an ally in this bird. Also, Asa is becoming like so interesting too. She was born with the mantra, with the power to like kind of hear people or like feel them in the area and she knows that there's only like a max group of two so that now the other straw hats who are on the ship know that they've been split up know that the other straw hats luffy robin zoro and chopper have been split up so i don't know what they're going to do with that information i don't know if they're going to go after them or what but the game is still on next one is pirate chopper versus vassal om it looks like chopper's going to get another fight yeah it said 25 remain then but then yama got pushed over the edge so i think 24 24 remain in this game. Robin is finding something is off with this El Dorado place. But also she sees like this beanstalk thing that's going up into the sky. It's very Jack and the Beanstalk, I like that. And also has Chopper been defeated because he runs into Om and runs away when he sees that Om has this huge dog called Holly. And Om says there's no path of life, only the way towards sadness. He has a survival rate of 0% iron challenge. And Chopper looks to be KO'd. So does that mean Chopper's out of the competition? This Om person seems awful. And also Zora's been taken away by a big huge bird. The bird that he was like saying do you want to fight in the previous chapter? So I have no idea where the bird's taken him, but it reminds me of when Zoro and Luffy first set off on their adventure together and Luffy tried to catch a bird, but ended up getting taken to, I think, Syrup Village. I think that's where they headed. No, Syrup, no, it wasn't. It was Orange Town, Orange Town. So I find that funny that now Zoro's the one that's being taken away by a bird. Kamakiri has also been lightning struck and Raki is going to try and avenge him and say something about the rumble rumble fruit. And that's the fruit that Inuru has taken. Obviously it wasn't like a god or anything like that, but he does have lightning powers from the devil fruit. So that's interesting. I think I should have known that. I think I probably did know that subconsciously before this chapter, but I feel like it was more like laid bare in this one. Like this is obviously his technique, his power. But shame about Chopper though, shame that he lost that fight. I don't know if you can hear the rain right now, but it's quite heavily raining and I have a couple of skylights in here, so you might be able to hear it during these updates. I haven't mentioned Luffy in a while and that's because he's inside a big snake. He's like in this big python and he's trying to find a way out so he's like punching inside of this big python and the python is wriggling around and it's causing quite a lot of chaos for everyone involved. The bird is bringing Zoro to this python thing and there are several other members or at least players in this game around. So we have opposing people in this game in this area and then Luffy bringing this python into the mix as well. So that's quite funny. A fine chapter. It just feels like people are just being brought to a certain place. Nami has entered the forest. She's taken Asa with her. This is Shandora, the lost city of gold. Doesn't it look incredible? And I'm so glad Robin is like the first person to discover it in who knows how long. Like it's been lost for so, so long. And Robin, the one who is like the history buff, the one who appreciates the past, 
is the one to come across it first. I love that for her, she deserves it. My heart was in my mouth when Zoro discovered Chopper because it does look like Chopper's dead, he's not. I don't think he is anyway. But I'm just like, do you seek revenge now to Zoro? And Zoro says, no, I don't like to fight with the motive, but I can feel one coming on. So Zoro, please, 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 Put him in the ground. But it looks like Zoro might have to face the iron challenge, which is pretty much like iron clouds. They are as light as clouds, but they are as strong as iron. And they're almost like barbed wire as well. And you don't know where you're gonna stand if it'll activate one. So Zoro has a job on his hands, that's for sure. Luffy's still in this serpent. And I like the titles. I like the chapter titles of these. There was one that said March. This title was sweet. And the next one is Concerto. And it's like, building up this beautiful melody or like having those music terms is really great at capturing what happens in these chapters. So like there's loads of different things that are happening of course, like we have March, we're like marching to war or like marching to battle even. I wouldn't say the war was like a, a war like in Alabaster, but it's definitely a crazy, crazy battle game. There were quite a number of different things happening in this chapter too. Like, you know, the musical term for sweet. Like a kind of mishmash of things. So like things are happening quite chaotically at the minute. So I really like the chapter names. I like how they've tied into the, the story. I'm sorry, but now every single time I say the word wiper, I think wiper stop wiping. You know, like swiper stop swiping in Dora the Explorer. Yeah, again, there's still just chaos happening. People are fighting. Zoro is still fighting Om and he's getting wounded and it doesn't look like he's in good stead. And Luffy's still inside this bloody snake. Nami has brought Asa into the battlefield though, which is not good. Although now it looks like Nami, Asa, Ganfo and Pierre have been also swallowed by the snake. So fortunately, I think they're on the way to Luffy so they can explain to him that he's inside a snake instead of him trying desperately to get out causing all of this chaos and destruction. Of course, Luffy's the only person who could do that. Yeah, I, I can't even give an opinion on this chaos. I can't. I, I think I'm just giving you guys a summary, but I'm just following along with what's happening, or at least trying to. There's a lot going on at once, and I do still really like it, I do. Apparently there's only one hour until, or at least like now less than an hour until the Anura's prophecy comes true. Like it's saying like one hour left. <laughs> Don't cut through the stomach. You wanna mess around and make the snake mad? You wanna throw your life away? I'd like to see the idiot who do that for real. In walks Luffy. <laughs> Honestly, I love, love, love how funny this series can be. Juxtaposing that with literally what happened a couple of pages before when Anura blasted Raki and electrocuted her and just seeing her arm looking like it's burned, falling to the ground. It's so harrowing. Like, the thing is though, he can smile and he can laugh, but he's just as crazy as Bellamy. And he's playing his game and he's having the time of his life. And people are like falling down left, right and center. And he's just, he seems invincible, but then again, so did Crocodile. Crocodile seemed invincible until Luffy figured out a way to overcome him and defeat him. So at the minute, it's just the fact that we don't know how to defeat this bastard. So he's not invincible. We just need Luffy to get out of the snake and beat his ass. Or just anyone at this point, honestly, just anyone. Oh, the cage that's around Zoro and a lot of the other people as well. It looks so painful when people touch it and there's like blood going everywhere. Ugh. So I feel like it's definitely ramped up in that I feel like everyone's pretty much in the same place now, even though Luffy and a few of the others are still in the snake's stomach. It's still in the same area and then Inura is there as well. And yeah, I think we're gonna get some, you know, more structured battles now in amongst all of this chaos that's been happening. So I'm excited to read those. See, I told you, I knew Zoro would find a way to beat Om. And I love the fact that he improved his technique from when he was fighting against Braham. And he ended up deflecting the Iron Cloud. Was it the Iron Cloud? Hitting Om straight in the face. And I think it's KO'd him. It's never really explicitly told because he's like, it's like literally in the middle of action as the chapter ended. But surely that is the KO move of the chapter. And Zoro, of course, bloody wins. It's Zoro. I love the fact that he always improves his fighting style and he always learns from the other fights from the arc and he just continues to improve. I love the fact that Luffy now finally realizes he's in a snake and he's been causing so much trouble this entire time. And Nami has to like literally pound his ass to put some common sense into him. Not a whole lot else to say about the chapter just other than it was really cool to say Zoro 
even though the odds were stacked against him, yet again, he shows us that he can do it. It'll be interesting to see how Luffy, Nami, Ganfo and Pierre get out of the snake. They need to freaking get out of it ASAP because it's just not good for anyone. I'm really like loving it again. Like this game has honestly just been so exciting. Okay, firstly and most importantly, the cover story of chapter 273 is Ace. Ace is back. Sorry about the dying and dash. Oh, honestly, you never need to apologize, Ace. Just wanted to quickly mention that, just as I saw it at the end of the chapter there. But I have to correct myself on some things. The first thing is Ineru had been in the City of Gold before. He's already taken all the gold. There's no gold there. And Robin finds that out. She realizes that a great golden bell should be there, as well as a poneglyph. But both of them are missing. And when Ineru comes and sees Robin there, and she talks to him, he tells her that, you know, he's already been there, the gold's already gone. And then she asks about the bell, but he doesn't seem to know about it. And then and when she says, oh, you mustn't, he then remembers the 400 year old story about the bell coming to the sky and there being this great ringing in the sky. So they're both quite excited about the fact that there is potentially a, a golden bell in the sky. So I feel like that is going to tie into the song that Ganfo mentioned earlier on when he said something about a song being played. Or was it Ganfo? It might have been someone else. No, I think it was Ganfo. About a song being played when peace comes back to the land or something like that. So I wonder if the bell has something to do with that. I wonder if they have to find this bell now in order to bring peace. Maybe it has something to do with the electricity or the lightning power that Ineru has and the bell will be some kind of conduit and that's kind of how they defeat him, maybe? I'm just spitballing here, I could be totally wrong. But Robin's excited about the fact that there could be a poneglyph as well, so I'm happy for her, I really am. Well, first I was scared for her actually, because when her and Eneru are the only people, the only people there in considering Eneru's track record of pretty much eliminating anyone who's come across him, I was really worried for Robin there, but he seems to have left her alone. And he says there's only eight minutes left while Zoro is still trying to fight, and he does end up taking Om down and this is hilarious as well, when Holly, the huge giant dog is there, Zoro ends up telling him to stay and then Holly obeys and then Zoro says bang your head and pass out and that's exactly what Holly does. Probably the most important thing that happened though happened with Connors and her father and like this is getting like kind of like biblical in a way which I mean is great, like I'm really loving the parallels to it but one of Eneru's kind of, you know, past soldiers or whatever. He says that he's going to crash Skypiea into the blue sea and he's going to literally have it coming, crashing down the entire city, the entire country down. He's going to bring it down from the sky. And that's his great grand plan. It is very reminiscent of Crocodile and his plan to destroy Alabasta. So like I'm seeing like a lot of parallels to Alabasta with this arc, but I really do love the kind of biblical tones of it, especially since apparently he has an arc so that he will be able to escape, which again is reminiscent of like Noah's arc and rebirth and renewal. And that is, oh, uh, like he's just gonna like pretty much kill everyone and it's so sinister, but I guess that's what makes a good villain, isn't it? Like, I can't understand why he'd wanna destroy the entire place. Like he got the gold and he has the power. He's just having fun. Essentially, I feel like that's what I'm getting from it, is he's just having a bloody blast. I mean, we've only got eight minutes, but honestly, the fact that Ace is back in the cover stories makes me so happy. Oh, I'm actually sad for the snake. Inuru has literally obliterated it as it was crying. It was crying. It had tears coming out of its eyes because, because it saw its homeland. That's so sad. But it was looking for something. But also Luffy and Ace are still inside the snake. So like, what's happened to them? And Pierre went in after him because, oh, I didn't mention this, but Pierre did manage to get Ganfo and Nami out, but Luffy had accidentally been blasted back in and he was holding on to Asa, so they both had to go back inside the snake. Or at least like they had no choice, they fell in. And so Pierre went in after them to save them, but now the snake has just been like, pfft, lightened. So there's six people left, including Nero. And Nero is saying like, he prophesies five and there are six. So one of them has to battle it out and eliminate one of them. And they're all like, nope, not doing it. You're the one who's going to be eliminated. And he's like, bad choice, bad choice, bitches. I mean, at the minute, how the hell are they going to beat him? <laughs> but also like, Luffy needs to get out this bloody snake. He's been inside it for bloody ages. I want to see him fight. 
But if anyone's going to do it, I love seeing Zoro and Robin standing next to Ganfo and who was the other one who had survived? Wiper. Wiper, stop wiping. Oh, it's so exciting. I'm repeating myself because it's just so exciting. I've got no other words to describe it. And it really is just an amusement to Ineru. And I'm still, I'm like, oh, I don't know how they're going to defeat him. I said this about Crocodile though, and they still did it. So... Ah, I've just got to have faith. Holy shit and holy fucking shit. Oh, not Robin and not Ganfo as well. They've both been defeated, which means there's only really four left now. But more of Inaru's plan is being brought to light. I'm starting to understand now why he's bringing the Skypea down. And he's saying it's like unnatural to be up there. The land is the land and... You know, it's not right for them to be up there. And he's trying to get to the Endless Voss. And I think in doing what he's doing and he's thinning out the weak, he is bringing only the good people to somewhere he calls Godland. And that's what he's trying to build. He's trying to build this invincible place where only the chosen few go. And then Robin's like, well, what if we refuse? And then Arrow goes, well, what if I fucking blast you with lightning, bitch? And that's exactly what he freaking does. And I hate him. I hate him so much. And what a gut punch this chapter was as well, because we start the chapter with some kids on Angel Island, or like at least in Skype here, and they're talking about random things, about like how the family there, like Connors and her dad, were traitors. But then one of the kids says something about their dad working for the Kami. And then we later find out that Inaru, the Kami, has pretty much defeated all of the men who ended up working for him because when he revealed their plan to them, they rebelled and he defeated them. So this little kid has probably just lost a dad. Like how sad and sinister is that? Although I genuinely haven't seen a single person die. At the same time, I don't really think anybody really dies. I think there's just so many instances where either somebody comes back to life or somebody gets so badly beaten but they do come back you know they're not like totally gone they're just badly beaten and knocked out and that's exactly what's happened in this arc left right and center just everyone's been beaten to fuck and i think that's probably just what's happened to all these men so i can't trust that anyone is actually dead but it's still sinister how inaru has done all of this you know i'm just gonna quickly youtube how to say his name, because I feel like I've been saying his name wrong this entire time. No, I can't look, I can't look, I, I don't want to say a spoiler. Anyway, I'm just going to say his name the way I say it. Oh yeah, so Inaru says, land is the place for land, humans have a place for humans, and the Kami has a place for the Kami, each has a place to which it must return. The foundation of this country in the sky is unnatural, and he seeks paradise, a land that is worthy of him. He's very full of himself, isn't he? He's very full of it. I mean, he has pretty much taken down everyone who's come across him, so far and uh, I mean I can see he has a little bit of a complex going on I'm praying for his downfall I really am not what he did to my Robin oh but Ace is on the cover of the next chapter gathering information oh gathering information it's his great search for Blackbeard and there is a chef chasing after him I love that wow oh fucking shit I I'm so sorry for my language as well but like what the fuck what the fuck can they do he literally died, or at least like in the equivalent of a One Piece, you know, death. And he ended up restarting his own heart with his powers. Ineru, by the way. Well, what? Oh my gosh, poor Wiper though. Wiper, stop wiping. Oh, and like, he used the Sea Prism. It was a, the Sea Prism, wasn't it? That absorbs the devil fruit powers that we saw in, which arc was it? It was the Alabaster arc, I'm sure, yeah. When they were in the cage. Sea Prism. It's a storm that sucks the power of those with devil fruit powers. Yes! Yes! I remember. They were in the cage. They were in the cage in Alabaster. And yeah, so that came back. But then Wiper also used, and I said this before as well, the reject dial. And he said he had one left and that it would vaporize him or something like that. And that he was going to save it for an arrow. And I was like, he's going to sacrifice himself, isn't he? Well, well... I wasn't wrong. But what the fuck? And Eru's literally just come back from the dead. He really is unstoppable. What the fuck? And Zoro tried to fight him as well, but to no avail. But fortunately, he hasn't been KO'd. Bless Wiper for jumping in there. What can they do to to defeat him? They need to bring back the Light of Shandora. Oh, I, I, why do I think that the lightning, his lightning powers will do something with the bell? And I just feel like that has to work into it somehow, right? 
Oh, uh, like, okay, it's, what time is it? It's 1.30 a.m. right now. I've been reading this for, like, 10 hours. I've been reading One Piece for, like, 10 hours now, just, like, well, I've had breaks. I've had breaks throughout the day and stuff. But, like, I really should go to bed. But I might try and get to maybe chapter 280. I feel like 280 is a good place to stop, right? So I did finish volume 29, and now I am on volume 30. Volume 30. Oh, and we have Luffy and Inaru on the cover there as well, showing off their six packs. I'm not going to show you mine, because I don't have one. But yeah, I was going to call it a day after finishing volume 29. But I think I'll just read a couple more chapters. Maybe I'll read until like 2 a.m. Like, I'll read for another half an hour, see how far I get. <laughs> this is like an arc that I just can't really stop reading right now. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> it's bloody hopeless. <laughs> I'm losing all hope, but Zoro might have both been defeated. And there was like this huge animal, lightning animal that came from Ineru's back as well. That was so cool. I mean, not great because obviously it took out Zoro. But like, it was pretty cool to see. It was quite a spectacle. But Wiper, oh my god, I thought he had been KO'd after he used the, the dial. But no, he was still standing. He was still fighting and trying to get his homeland back for his ancestors. He's fighting for his ancestors. Like, I absolutely admire and love his determination to do that. He is not giving up what his ancestors have been fighting for for 400 years. He wasn't going to give that up. I love that. I think that's so fantastic. And I feel like uh, it was expertly explored with Wiper in some of the flashbacks. There was one of the ancestors who said something that was a bit ominous. Great warrior Kalgora had, and then it just cuts off. Yeah, this ancestor I was about to tell Wiper, the reason that was most important to Kalgora, the great warrior Kalgora, and then nothing. So I'm interested to find out what that means, but we don't get answers right now. But Nami being the literally the last one standing, until Luffy gets out the freaking snake. Like, I'm surely he's still alive. He's still alive. But like, get out that freaking snake, God's sake. Nami is technically the last one standing. And she tells Inaru to take her with him. So hopefully she has a plan up her sleeve. And it's the only thing she could have done without getting blasted by lightning. And what else could she do, really? Oh, I'm losing hope. Oh, Ace has been thrown in the river. How dare they? It's so cool to see the Wiper Rays again, because I was wondering where the hell they were this entire time. And Connus is going to try and, I think, inform everyone of what the Inaru, the Kami, is doing, so that hopefully they can overrule and help in some way. Luffy is finally out of the snake. Like, honestly, I'm so happy. And I was like, oh, I can breathe again with him out of that snake. I feel like I was trapped in the snake. So glad he's out, but he's now seen the destruction. He's seen Zoro has been fried. Robin comes to a little bit and says that he has taken Nami and that Skypea is going to be destroyed. So Asa with her mantra can hear two voices and Luffy is telling her to take him to them. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry to get tired, so I will probably go to bed now, actually. I feel like this is a good way to finish off for the night, especially since now Luffy is back in the game, and he is now going to be on his way to Inaru, and hopefully kicking his ass. Hopefully. The way that Luffy got out of that snake as well, and, like, had its eye and was, like, uh, holding the eyelid up, that was gross. I mean, it did end up going out through his mouth, but still. Uh, also, the bloody arc... Have you seen it? It's huge. The Ark is huge. And now he's revealed that to Nami, the Ark Maxim, and he says he has an access of power, but he must save that. He needs a conduit source for mechanical energy, which is where the gold hidden on the island comes in handy. So that's why he was using the gold for, essentially. Oh, there's something to do with this energy. And you know how earlier on we had the punch and like the, the dial taking the weight of it and then bringing that energy back? I feel like some thing to do with his energy, I'm not thinking straight because I am getting tired, will have something to do with his downfall. And I do think this golden bell has something to play with it as well. But yeah, exciting times, exciting times. Just like me going to bed, actually. Yeah, I think I'm gonna go to bed. And I will continue in the morning. I will instead dream tonight of me kicking in Aru's ass, among other things. 
Which pieces of garbage are you referring to? What a prick. <laughs> I love that Connors is trying to get the people in Skypea to leave and to tell them the truth about Akami, Kami and Aru. And they are kind of not exactly believing her at first. The moment when that kid threw the rock at her or whatever it was that he threw and it made her bleed and she still stood there. She still was like don't trust him, he's going to destroy Skypea. She didn't let that bother her. And even though she was bleeding, she still went for it. Like, oh, what a queen. I do feel bad for her as well because a good few chapters back, her dad did get pushed over the side of the cliff thing and it seemed that he might be gone. But again, I'm not trusting that there was a death, so I didn't mention it before. I was like, he's probably fine. But it's incredible to see the chokehold that Inaru has on these people. Like, seriously, he has them all terrified and they can't, like... Well, they feel like they can't go against him even when he's not there because of how his power works and how he can hear for miles and miles and miles. So everyone's scared of it, but then punishment doesn't come on Connor, so they're a little bit like, hmm, what's going on? But now Luffy has arrived. Oh, which pieces of garbage are you referring to? Like, that's a bit of a sick burn, not gonna lie. But it's terrible. Don't refer to my straw hats as pieces of garbage. <laughs> Again, why didn't I think of this? Earlier, Luffy's made a rubber. So obviously, Anoru and his lightning powers are going to be useless on him. Ugh, like what a great moment of realization that was. When you see his face and how he's scared, like I see how scared he is, the little bitch. Even just like the, the lightning strike on Luffy and it looked like he would get it because it looked so powerful. Like how could he survive that? Well, and Naru underestimated him, so that's how he survived it. It was also cool to hear more about Bilka as well, which is where Inaru was originally from. And then that part of the Sky Island disappeared six years ago when Inaru came to Skypea and took over. So he's already done this to another place. He did it to his hometown. So that is really interesting. I do hope they manage to stop it. And I think they will. Everyone's like running to get off this island now. And then Captain McKinley is on Connors' side. And the White Berets are going to help as well. So it's nice to see them back. And when I said before as well about the men who are working for Inaru. And a lot of the families in Skypea are wondering where they are. And when I said it's heartbreaking because we did get that chapter before. Of that young boy saying oh my dad's working for the Inaru. But we know that Inaru has pretty much KO'd the entire team that were behind him, you know, the people that were fighting for him, his army essentially. So there's a lot of family stuff that's kind of tricky in how everyone's connected. But Luffy landed a punch on Inaru. I don't think he's KO'd though. I don't think he's down down. I mean, he's bleeding on the floor, but I don't think that's it. I am anticipating this fight to last a good few chapters. Okay, I did think that Luffy had the upper hand, but of course, Inaru has loads of other little moves and tricks up his sleeve. So the fact that Naru hadn't heard of rubber and it wasn't a thing in like the white white sea is a good thing in Luffy's favor. However, he still has his mantra. He can still predict Luffy's moves and dodge them as much as he can. And they do get some hits in on each other, which is fantastic. It's so exciting. Naru changes his staff into like this trident and he says, oh, so your, uh, your weakness is sharp objects or something like that. And then Luffy says, yeah, it is. And I was like, don't tell him that. <laughs> It was so cool actually as well when Inaru kind of used the gold to move. Like he went through it and he appeared behind Luffy because he'd used the gold. Like he went, like I think the lightning went inside it or something. Like I don't know how it works, but like that was cool because yeah, it kind of like conducted him in a way, which meant that he could move to a totally different place. It was cool. It was very cool. But the battle I don't think is anywhere near over. I love how it takes something that's almost pretty goofy in order for Luffy to win or at least like win this kind of round against Inaru and to stop himself from thinking and so that the mantra won't work on him. I was just like, what is Luffy up to? But I should never also underestimate him. Gum gum space out. And he's literally just standing there like that, looking looking like that. So that Inaru can't hear what he's gonna think. Cause if he's spaced out, he's not actually thinking about what he's doing and he can just use his instincts to dodge attacks, which is so cool and so smart. Gum gum octopus. <laughs> But actually uses the um the actual ship to go against Inaru because he can't exactly hit him himself. So he's kind of damaging the ship and it's kind of bouncing back and hitting Inaru so that he can't exactly predict 
that. <laughs> so Luffy's constantly adapting to his situation and he has so many great moves under his belt and great ideas too. As goofy as it did look to begin with. And also Skype here is definitely like this is like so intense right now because there is a dark cloud above the upper yard and even the people in Skype here are like the sky has never looked like that before and they know that something bad is about to happen and it's just chaos. It's absolute chaos at the minute. Ah, my God, Usopp and Sanji are finally awake again. Oh my gosh, they've been out of this story for far too long, but they're climbing up the side of the arc, which is awesome. So they'll be with Nami on this arc. Hopefully they can do something about this. <laughs> Luffy's hand got caught in like this gold ball thing, wasn't able to escape it, and he's been thrown overboard. And I don't know what's happened to Asa and Pierre, but he did bring out a, a lightning strike when they were trying to save Luffy. So who knows what actually happened to them? Did they get KO'd? Did they get taken out? Sometimes I forget this is still a game. This is still a game to him. And like, it's just gotten like so much more serious and deadly. The arc is like starting to fly now. It's like going up, which is pretty cool to see actually, not gonna lie. It's quite a huge arc as well. The fact that this can like be lifted off the ground is quite a feat. But also the people in Skype are like, wow, it's flying. It was a touching moment as well when Nami was like, I don't want any of it anymore. When she realizes that she won't be with anyone, she'll be alone without her friends. And the little flashback to when they were at the campfire was like so nice and so wholesome. But I'm excited to see what Usopp and Sanji do. I mean, what can they do against this apparently godlike being? The fact Sanji would sacrifice Usopp for Nami is brilliant. <laughs> Poor Usopp though, and the fact that he landed an exploding star move on Inaru at the end of the chapter was actually pretty fantastic. And especially since he ends up saying like, sorry at the end, it's like, this is so Usopp. Also, I love the fact that Nami was using like some of the techniques and the knowledge she got when she was in Alabasta and she was using the sort of like her weather stick and she's able to redirect his lightning strikes because yeah of course like that's kind of what she did in Alabasta. She used like weather patterns and stuff to work to her advantage so it's really cool that she got to do that and it was a good moment as well to see her really stand up against him and actually last a bit longer than a lot of other people who have faced him have done. I think Acer is going to help Luffy now as well especially since he still has a giant ball on him. But I feel like she can really use her powers. Like she was born with the mantra. So like she can do something that will most likely help Luffy win. It's something that's going to be, you know, game changing. And I love the fact that Asa has been like very understated so far. Like she's been present and she's kind of been observing quite a lot. And like people know of her power, but like she's kind of just like almost biding her time. So I do hope that she ends up doing something that will help Luffy. And it was also nice to see Robin helping Zoro as well with her power, helping him move him to safety. That was really nice. And I think she was also helping Wiper too. I feel like she is like officially part of the crew now, like officially, officially. Like there's no way she can just leave now, right? But then again, I did say the same about Vivi. Oh. Vivi, I miss her. Oh my god, it was so awesome to see Nami, Sanji, and Usopp literally battle the Inaru. Like, they were using their skills, their talents. They didn't need Luffy, although I feel like they do need Luffy to take Inaru out. But, like, they had a plan, and they were fantastic. One thing that made me absolutely chuckle was when Usopp and... <laughs> you just seen the panel. Usopp and Nami are like... Well, I'd like to save you, but we're up against the comedy, you know? And she's like, I know, right? <laughs> and they're both just like laughing. And then in the next panel, they get blasted away. Like, <laughs> it's the fact like Nami's just like, oh, God. it's so funny. I never feel like when I mention what I find funny, it actually comes across as funny, but you know what I mean. But I was wondering why Sanji was the entire time because I was like, Usopp's like taking the brunt of so much of this right now, which is amazing. Honestly, you never would expect Usopp to do that. Or at least you kind of do. Like he would do it reluctantly and he does do it reluctantly. But like even he says, like he's the Kami, like how can they defeat him? It's, it's a bit hopeless for them. But no, he still has a plan. He helps Nami and they get her off the ship and Usopp's come back. Sanji has told him to drop dead. And Sanji has sabotaged the ship as well. Like that's where he was the entire time. He was sabotaging the ship. Like what a great, 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 great plan. Because if they can't really defeat the Kami, then why don't they stop him from getting away? You know, like why don't they stop him from manifesting his plan and making it come to fruition, you know? And that's just so good. So good. I love the fact that they were so 
a genius. They were genius in this chapter. I really missed all of the guys being together. Like I'm really missing Zoro and Chopper at the minute too. And even Robin, like Robin is conscious and she has been doing little things to help, but it's nice to see that she's actually doing something. I feel so bad for Zoro and Chopper being like totally KO'd right now. They put up such a good fight before, but I do miss them. I need them back in my life. Going on to the last chapter of volume 30. Oh my God. Also Ace has infiltrated the Navy. Like he's got the Marine cap on. And he's at the Navy's all-you-can-eat buffet. He's like literally just like Luffy, isn't he? Self-service and he's piling up that plate so much. What an absolutely epic end to that chapter with all of the lightning bolts raining down on Sky Pier from the dark cloud that's gone over them. Like that's so exciting. Like this might be one of my like, favorite moments from the entire series so far because I love things like that. I love when things look to be like it's gonna get destroyed and there's just like this huge epic thing that's happening and even in Naru, like I really do like the fact that he's improvising quite a lot because even though Sanji sabotaged the ship he is still able to keep it afloat he's still able to I think use these really outdated dials all these ancient dials that don't exist anymore back from his hometown in order to keep the ship afloat so he's like this isn't gonna affect me like I'm still gonna go through with my plan and I just love that. I love how formidable a four Inaru is. Oh, it's nice to see all the straw hats pretty much reunited. Nami's gone after Luffy, and Luffy's like gone up the, the stalk to reach the, the ship, the Ark. But Robin has, you know, managed to get a lot of people to safety. And Sanji and Usopp are now with her too. And then, yeah, Nami's gone off after Luffy. It was so cool as well to see all of the lost city or the city of Shandora. Yeah, the ruins of Shandora are under where they actually are. So that's all we've been saying this entire time. But the rest of the ruins are like directly underneath. And I love how everything is coming to a head here. Especially after all of the stories from Norland in the previous arc and how that's beautifully coming together in this place that was apparently a legend and is now like coming real, or at least it is true, it's, it's all true. And just the idea of it is just like so inspiring. It just reinforces the idea that anything could happen. Dreams come true, legends come true. The ending of this chapter, it's like the biggest cliffhanger I think I've read so far in One Piece. And the fact that the whole volume ends with that too, I can only imagine when this first came out and people had to wait for the next volume. I could only imagine. I'm so sorry you had to wait that long. Oh, amazing, like it connects. <laughs> of course it connects, it's order. He's making everything connect. But to see Noland be connected to Wiper's ancestor, I think his name was Kalgara, who was briefly mentioned before, that was so cool. The fact that they're connected, well, of course they're connected. They're both from the same time period. So I probably should have made that connection myself, but it's so cool to see Noland come into it. And I don't know if there's more flashbacks. So, yeah, there is. There's more flashbacks. So I'm going to say more about like how Noland connected with this place back then, how that has informed the stories and the legends that have been passed down. And the fact that everything he said is true. It's really intricate. It's really a quite beautiful storytelling. And nice to see how the Jaya arc is being so important in the current Skypea arc. Even though that arc was a lot of setup, it was still very vital and I think so cool to see it all unfold. And as you guys say as well, like Oda does things intentionally, like he knows what he's doing and I have to have trust in him that he is doing things with purpose and he is. This chapter was pretty much all a flashback. So it was very interesting. I don't really have any thoughts on it really. It was cool to see Noland really, honestly being such a badass. He ends up intervening in this sacrifice where a woman called Mouse, I think her name is, is about to be sacrificed to their god, Kashigami. But Noland ends up saving her and slicing the head off Kashigami. So like that is probably not a good thing, but at the same time, I'm glad she was saved because it just seemed like so weird that they think, you know, killing the most beautiful woman on the island will help appease the gods and like, you know, spilling blood and the sacrifice and stuff. But it's cool to see like how it was used in, in like the whole sacrificial altar thing, since we did see it earlier on in the arc and to see the way it was like originally used back then too. And to see like how the upper yard fit in with Jaya. There's also this tree fever that they are trying to find a cure for. And I'm wondering if this tree fever thing has anything to do with the present day, like how it's gonna connect 
because so far I'm not really seeing a whole lot of connection there, but I'm sure it does have something important to do with the present. As Robin said, like knowing the history of somewhere will help them to not make the same mistakes. And I think there is definitely something we can learn from these flashbacks in regards to the present, something I've learned from Robin. But at the minute, I'm still a little bit in the dark about it. So uh, I think there are quite a few more Wow, there's quite a lot of flashbacks. Wow. I like the next seven chapters are all flashbacks when I can see the, the black lines on there. Oh my God, okay. There's gonna be no straw hat mentions in the next few hundred pages. What can I say? I love seeing how Jaya split. I love seeing what led to the events of getting the upper yard into the Sky Islands. And all of this has been like really fascinating, honestly. Noland is fast becoming such an interesting character. I'm really liking the way that he has come into this. And he's like, what are you guys doing? Stop doing that. And like, there's this huge commentary, I think, on these ancient traditions that have obviously cost a lot of human life. And Noland is telling them like, this is needless. Like you don't need to be doing this. And he's been given until the next day's sunset to find a cure for the disease that's going around. And if he can do that, then he can prove that what they're doing is very needless. Although it does seem like things are stacked against him because an earthquake happens, which is what splits the island and Noland is like trapped and he's not able to get to the village. And Kilgara is there as well. Like what's he gonna do? Is he gonna kill her? I can't even remember like what actually happened happened to Noland. But no, it's like really interesting history. And that's why I was worried about it. I was worried I wouldn't be interested in it. But it's so exciting still. And even though it is a flashback, it feels so purposeful and I really enjoy it. This chapter was a great exploration into the faith and the science behind this world and which one they are going to, you know, follow. And Kalgara, I didn't even know that this is messy. This is so messy. But Mouse is Kalgara's daughter. I totally missed it. If that was mentioned beforehand, I totally missed it. But the way that it was revealed, literally he shouted out was my own daughter. And it's like, he was trying to put his village first. And like, that's what he's always been doing. He's trying to put his village first. And no matter the cost. And even if that cost was his daughter, if he thought that saving the village would come out of it, like would be the outcome of sacrificing his daughter, then he would do it. He was putting a lot of blind faith into like the gods in the antiquated systems that were in place here in Jaya. And it was so cool actually to see him change his mind and to save Noland and to kill what seemed to be Kashigami's child. Essentially like this big snake that's a little smaller than the previous one that Noland killed. So I'm assuming the child. So the fact that he makes that conscious decision that could have been a bad decision, but he still saw that Noland was kind of telling the truth like he wasn't sure of it but I think he had an inkling that okay this is like a tangible thing you know there was this disease that happened hundreds of years before and he's talking about that and now he can use that knowledge to save the people of Jaya and again we're going back to that history we're going back to learning things from the past so that we can prevent what happened in the past to happen again and it's essentially just an entire village of desperate people and it really does have strong parallels to what's happening at the minute in Sky Pier and especially with Captain McKinley who always sort of had an inkling about the Inaru but didn't want to do anything that would jeopardize the village you know so a lot of people are very selfless you have a lot of people who are selfish and are willing to do anything for the village that they're in and for the people around them. But Noland has really opened their eyes in that there has been a lot of needless killing, a lot of needless blood spilling. Like, you don't need to do that. You know, the lives of your people are more important than appeasing the gods, and you know, like things like that. So it was really interesting, actually, and we're still in the past. So what else can we discover? What in the world? I'm so confused. What's with the sudden change in Kilgara's attitude towards Noland? They were like best buds. They became best buds and even people said we haven't seen Kilgara laugh like that before. And yeah, it's been like a month later after, you know, he's cured them and, and stuff like that and things have changed. No one's been sacrificed or anything. But it seems like they're all growing tension between like two different groups. And one of them is like, we need to, you know, respect our tradition, you know? Like he's come in here and he's changed things up and we need to respect our history. And so like there are people who aren't happy with Noland. But at the same time, why is Kalgara acting the way he is? 
Like, that doesn't make sense to me. What's going on? The bell feels so important as well, especially since Noland had been hearing it out in the sea, and that's kind of what brought him to Jaya. And its location as well, we got to see Shandora in all of its glory, and it's beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. The double page spread of it, that is stunning. That is absolutely stunning. But the bell and the poneglyph are right there right in the center of it, which they aren't there anymore in the present day. So I'm looking forward to seeing it in Skypiea and hopefully Robin can get some stuff from the Poneglyph if it's still there, if it's still readable. Because they can't read it, the Shandians can't read it, so the only person I think can read it is Robin. But I wanna know what the hell Kilgara's thinking. Oh, my heart hurts a little bit, again. <laughs> I did get my answer pretty much straight away about why Kilgara totally blew off Noland and hated him. And it was because Noland had, and the crew had chopped down a lot of the sacred trees that were there because they housed the ancestors' souls or spirits. And that obviously pissed off everyone, but they were still grateful to them for saving their lives so they didn't like kill them or anything. But like, it was still like really sad. Like, and the fact that they had no idea why Nolan did it, but then they ended up finding out maybe just a little bit too late, was because the trays were infected themselves, and Nolan knew that, and he wanted to put the people first, which is what you should always do in these situations, and that's, I think that's what Nolan has taught these people, is to put your people first, and protect them, because when you protect them, then the village thrives, the village lives, you know? So it was really sad that the goodbye was rather bittersweet between Nolan and Kilgara, and it reminds me of when we first met Kilgara many chapters ago when he said something about like a regret like he had some kind of regret but he cut himself off and like we ended up not finding out about it and I think the regret is the fact that he like let Nolan go like the fact that he brushed him away and, and stuff like that so yeah I, it was nice to see that come full circle because I was wondering like what was he gonna say and also there's the snake as well that spends most of its time in Shandora the one that was accompanying Nolan and Kilgara I wonder if they have something to do with the snake that Luffy had like, accidentally, you know, went inside, um, which sounds wrong when I say it like that, and went like really sad and started crying when it saw the city of gold, and it was crying, and I was like, oh, the snake's crying, why is the snake crying? And is it because, like, I don't know if the snake is that snake from 400 years before, or if it's one of the snake's ancestors, or what, but I feel like that was probably a connection too, because of how it was in Shandora, it just like reminded me of that snake that was crying. But that was a sweet chapter, it was rather touching. Oh my god, I'm so sad. <laughs> Literally just one year before Nolan returned to the island. Oh, just one year before and it, that's when it, the, it happened, the upstream took it up and took the upper yard, took that part of Jaya up into the sky and started this whole mess in Sky Pier, especially with the Kami back then as well and them thinking it was a blessing for heaven and the Kami then was like, expel the people there, that's mine, it's where I live now sort of thing. So like, ah, oh, it's awful. Like honestly, what an awful, awful man. But I'm so glad we got to see how it began, how it started and by having that huge part, that, that huge chunk of history before we got to that moment just made it so much better because I felt invested. And that snake was the snake from before that Luffy was inside. I think her name was Nola and it's the same snake. The same snake, like that's so good. But didn't I tell you, I, I, you know what I was looking and I was thinking there must be some connection to the snake because the snake was crying when they saw Shandora. So it obviously meant something to them. Oh, but poor Norland getting executed by beheading because they thought he was a liar. Oh, that's so sad. Like I knew he didn't live. I knew they punished him. But, like, just to see it actually unfold after getting to know him better was honestly a punch in the gut. Oda knew that would happen, and he, he was like, I want to fuck you over anyway. So that was really sad to watch. Ah, oh, but that friendship between Kilgara and Noland, oh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Honestly, it was a messy friendship, but they still cared for one another, and Kilgara was ringing the bell. He was ringing the bell when the last earthquake happened and the knock-up stream blew them up into the sky. That's so sad. He was like trying to get Nolan to find them again. Oh, and then they never got to meet again. Oh, I feel like this hole in my heart now. <laughs> Probably the saddest chapter in the Skypea arc. I'm not gonna lie, I think it's the saddest chapter so far. Oh, the young wiper learning of his ancestors and the story of Nolan and wanting to ring the bell for him to try and bring him back home and stuff. Oh gosh, it's like, ugh. Oh. 
And the fact that Kalkara wanted to ring it as well so that I can just let him know that he's still there. He's still there, but he's... He's not. He's not physically, but he is. His soul and spirit and heart will always be there. Oh, anyway, we are back with the Straw Hats. I am so glad to be back in the action, the current action. Inaru is still raining havoc and everyone is just like fighting for their lives still. Honestly, it's been a long fight. It's been a long fight for their lives. They've been running for ages now. The bell seems to be at the top of the stalk, the giant jack or whatever it's called. And that's where Inaru's heading. It's where Luffy's heading. It's where everyone pretty much wants to head. And like I said before, I feel like that bell is so important. It's gonna be what brings about the end of this fight and bring peace to Skypea, Shandora, everywhere. It's gonna bring peace to all. Not a whole lot else to say about the chapter, just that I really appreciate the importance of ancestors and honoring the ancestors and honoring history. Ah, oh, Luffy. Oh. The fact that he hasn't forgotten Cricket, the fact that he still keeps Cricket's dream in his head and he wants to help him still, even amongst all of this chaos, and he wants to ring that golden bell for Cricket and to let everyone know that Norland was no liar, and that El Dorado existed, just as he said. That's the main reason why he's doing it, and of course to save the people of Skypea, of course. But it's so nice to again go back to Jaya, and back to Cricket, and to see how he left an impression on Luffy, even though he seemed, to me at the time, not that important of a character, but he's really driven Luffy, he's really put something in his head that has driven Luffy to honor somebody else's dream, which I feel like Luffy would have done anyway, but at the same time, I'm just like, oh, it's so good. Also, an arrow getting rid of the entire Angel Island, like completely decimating Angel Island. Like, when will he be stopped? Like, he needs to be stopped. It feels like this has been going on for years. And it probably was as it was getting drawn and written. But like, my heart can't take it anymore. It literally cannot. I need the resolution before I pass out. <laughs> it is fantastic to see Nami, who was the only person who could really control the wave there, really be able to lend a hand to Luffy because there was no way he would be able to drive it and get to Inaru and the bell. So Nami's like, hop on, but promise me you'll keep me alive. Love that, love that. Nami's uses are endless. <laughs> I love that we got that kind of silly moment early on in the arc of Nami being the only person who can really do the waiver and Luffy being so jealous of her and being like a little brat about it. But now it's like coming handy. It's gonna be a lifesaver. It's gonna help. We'll try and re reach this bell and fight against Inaru to stop him from literally obliterating all of Skypea now. He's sending down an even bigger cloud that's going to decimate the entire place. It's terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. I feel like I can definitely say Inaru is a villain because he is causing the worst destruction. He is putting so many lives at stake. Yeah, like even their escape route as well. He's destroyed their escape route. So now everyone's pretty much stranded on the sea. So like, how are they going to get out? Like, he's given them no choice and no option but to, like, die along with this entire place. Oh, he's an evil, evil man. And they also sent a leaf down to instruct them to cut down the vine, but make it fall to the west. So I'm wondering a little bit, like, how that's going to work, but we're going to trust their plan. And, like, now I've finished volume 31, I am on volume 32, which is the final part of Skypea and the start of the next arc. So I only have a few chapters left. Ah, it's been so good. <laughs> so exciting. I think this is probably like the most exciting arc in terms of like constantly keeping the tension and the action to a high level. So yeah, it's oh, it's been so good. Seeing so many different people coming together to try and get the giant Jack down is so heartwarming. And also why by making the connection that they are trying to ring the bell for Cricket, who is the descendant of Norland, and that realization, that moment of realization, that he can still do something that will like honor his ancestors and you know give him like so much meaning and something that he's been striving to do, so that he even gets in on trying to get this giant Jack down. I, I got chills just thinking about it. I'm cold everywhere. Even Nola tries to get it to come down too, and Usopp's putting his exploding stars on it. Zoro's trying to chop it down, and it's just like they're coming together. Like this is what great teamwork. Is. Is, like Inaru has no one. He has nobody on his side. Whereas Luffy and Nami who are up trying again to like reach them and trying to reach the bell, they have a whole team behind them. And uh, it's great to watch. It's so great to watch. But honestly, my favorite moment of the chapter was when Wiper learned 
that what Luffy was doing and learning about cricket. And oh, that was just, oh, I don't have words. <laughs> Just as I was about to film the update on this chapter, this came, I ordered this off Amazon a few days ago and it arrived just before I got a knock at the door. I ran to get it, I knew what it was, and I believe I can watch these. These are the first three One Piece movies and they are set during the arcs I've read, essentially, so there shouldn't be any spoilers, but please do correct me if I'm wrong down below, but I believe it's safe for me to watch these One Piece movies. Yeah, One Piece the movie, One Piece Adventure on Spiral Island, one Piece, Chopper's Kingdom, and the Strange Animal Island. Ooh, oh, I'm so excited. I'm, so ex I'm still making my way through the TV show as well. I think I'm on season four or five. And I will be watching the G8 filler arc as well before I read the next arc, which is Long Ring, Long Land. Anyway, I'll mention that again at the end, just in case anybody misses this part. Going back to the chapter then, I don't really have a whole lot to say about it other than it's still really exciting. Luffy, with that gold ball thing that's on his hand, and it being a conduit to the electricity and stuff and the lightning has went into like the storm cloud thing and Inaru was like, well shit, yeah, it can conduct the uh, the power there. So because Luffy's done that, there is a sort of like, the clouds above have kind of opened as well and dispersed those like thunder clouds that Inaru had put out. So it looks like this is like the beginning of the downfall for Inaru. Like he thinks he has the upper hand right now, but does he fuck? He rang the bell. <sighs> I think Inoru is defeated as well. I don't know because it's still like in the middle of all the action. But Luffy rang the goddamn bell. And oh, like I really feel the relief of doing that. Like this has been 400 years between the Shandians and the Skypeans. Oh, like this is meaning so much to so many people right now. I'm so happy. I'm so happy got to ring them. And then Cricket will hopefully hear it. I hope he does. And hopefully the people of Jaya will hear it too. And they'll be like, oh, who knew? Who knew that Norland was right? Oh, this is so satisfying. This is what this arc and the previous arc was. Just so satisfying. Also really, like, really tense and exciting, of course, but satisfying as well. Another exciting clash with Inaru, uh, between Inaru and Luffy. Like, I feel like I can breathe. I mean, I don't know if he's actually down down yet. I don't know if he's down down. I want to read on to find out. We're right here. Oh, when Craig started crying and realized that the Straw Hats went on their adventure and they found El Dorado. Like that is what, it's all about the adventure, finding your goal, making dreams come true, being happy. Oh, it was so embodied in that image of Luffy in the clouds. And it was a really great callback to when we saw those like, like giant angels, like really early on where they looked so huge. And that scene like really terrified me. But seeing how it's like the shadow that was brought down from the people of the sky, like that explains that whole panel. And then you see Luffy in the sky and he's like, jumping for joy he's like happy because he's done what he was set out to do and he found El Dorado he oh like this adventure was incredible oh Inaru is defeated and he's going down the ship thank god I wasn't 100% sure but now he's, he's definitely going down this ship so that's so exciting but I just can't get over cricket I can't get over cricket I can't get over what Luffy did he managed to ring the bell that's 400 years 400 years leading up to this moment and he did it. He helped them. And oh, now there's peace. And even Ganfo was like, I always knew this day would come. And just, oh, I can let out the breath I didn't know I was holding. Honestly, like, look at that. It's Luffy in the sky. Oh, oh look at him crying. Oh. Even Nola in Shandora, which rhymes, is so happy. The song of the island. The golden bell fulfilled its purpose and then ending with we're right here which is exactly what Noland and Calgara set out to do to let each other know that they're right there. Absolutely beautiful. Still have a few chapters left but it was just beautiful. I'm on the 300th chapter now. Oh brilliant. This is the true milestone. Ah oh, and now my coffee's gone cold. I keep forgetting it's there. See I knew Connors's dad wouldn't be dead. I knew it. I mean I was a little worried for him for a little bit but knowing order and knowing how very rare it is that people actually die. Usually if they do die, they come back. 
I really didn't worry that much. This chapter mainly just dealt with the aftermath. Everyone's partying. They're saying for like the first time in 400 years, nobody wants to fight. And it's so nice to see those bridges get mended and to see people like live again and not live in fear. It's so relieving to see that happen. And just so, again, satisfying. Seeing Luffy partying with everyone at the end while well, all of the Straw Hats joining in on the party. Just everyone being happy. This is what it's all about. This is getting to these moments where after a big battle, you have that period of calm where there's not a wrong thing happening in the world. Like, it's like they don't have to care about anything right now. They can just be happy. Ah, oh, and that makes me so happy. But yeah, not a lot to say about this chapter. I don't think there'll be a lot to say about this ch next chapter or the one after that with this being like the cool down period after the fight with Inaru. I said there wasn't gonna be much to talk about, but oh boy, is there much to talk about. Oh, especially in regards to Robin and the Poneglyph. So yeah, they do end up coming across the Poneglyph and Robin reads it and realizes that it's just part of one of many, like like the documents. So there are two types of Poneglyphs. There are ones with like information and ones that reveal the location of others. So they're all gonna kind of connect and make this like one, like the, the real Poneglyph doesn't really exactly exist yet, but that's Robin's job now. She's gonna be like, I think reading all the Poneglyphs, taking it to the end of the Grand Line. And she mentioned something as well. I hope I guide this document to its end, guide this document. She mentioned something about, oh yeah, to the end of the Grand Line, to Raftal. To Raftal, is Raftal a person or a place? That's what I wanna know. But also the fact that Goldie Roger had been there as well. Like he made it to the Sky Island, he left like information and there's just like some weird connection with Goldie, Roger and Luffy. Ganfo says, that boy with a straw hat, to me he had the same feel about him as Roger once did. And Robin says, his name is Monkey Day Luffy. I'm quite interested in him myself. So like this whole day business is crucial. <laughs> it's crucial. And even Robin's interested. And I feel like that's partly one of the reasons why she has joined Luffy in order to like find out everything she possibly can. She's someone who just craves information. She craves information, she's looking for answers and she needs all the answers. I love, love the end because Luffy and the gang are like stealing gold and stuff and they're trying to get on the ship and then Robin comes with all like the Skypeans because they're gonna give them the part of the bell that had fallen and they were gonna give it to them, you know, as a thank you. But Luffy and everyone thinks that they're gonna come after them because they've taken this gold. So they're like, Robin, run and stuff like that. It's so good. Like it's such a good end of this chapter, even with all of the serious stuff that's going on and the revelations that Robin has just come to as well. Yeah, Goldie Roger, I hereby guide this document to its end. So even he knew the language of the Poneglyphs and now Robin's job or Robin's goal now, I think, is to connect all of the Poneglyphs and read in them that they'll become a document that fills in the blank history for the first time. It will make a complete text, the real Poneglyph, which doesn't yet exist. So this huge revelation for Robin is like huge. It's like, this is a big thing. I love this. I love the fact that we have this storyline as well going forward. I can't wait to find the next Poneglyph. Like, I'm really invested now. It's, oh man, yeah, uh, really important chapter. And I thought I was gonna be able to say anything about it, but no, it was so interesting. Like I need to catch up with this series like ASAP. It's taken so long. <laughs> oh, I can't believe I finished this saga. The entire saga, not just the arc, but the saga. And what a great ending it was. Oh, it just, it came beautifully together by the end of it. This chapter was so good. It's so nice to see Skypea start to heal. It was so nice of them to acknowledge Ganfo and what he was trying to do even before all of this, trying to bring peace to both people and making him sort of like calm me again. But I think in a totally different way to it used to be. It's more like a, you know, just a way of being a bright light in the land and... Yeah, it was great. I love the fact that the Straw Hats have all this gold and then being like, oh, what should we get? What should we get? In Port Shop, all he wants is books. And then there's Zoro who was like at the end of the panel, like booze. So funny. Please buy me books. <laughs> Chopper is me. Oh, I love how they got out of Skype here as well with the Octo Balloon thing. That was really cool. And it's gonna be so great as well to have them back in the East Blue, back on land, essentially. I'm really excited to see where they go next, but it was a really great chapter and a great end to it. Just like happy, I'm just happy. So that is the entire 
Skypiea arc done. The entire Sky Island saga as well. And I thought it was a really great arc. Honestly, it was probably one of the most exciting that I've read so far. The whole game aspect of it as well, only for it to get that more sinister as it goes on. Inaru was a fantastic villain, really formidable, and his ideals, the themes that were explored in this saga, this arc, were so are deep and so insightful too in the characters and their motivations. I love how the Jaya arc and the Skypiea arc just complement each other beautifully. And there were so many like really important things I thought, especially to do with the Poneglyphs, with Goldie Roger, the progress of so many people. Ah, oh, and like just the whole Cricket and Nolan thing as well. Just, ah, oh, that was so beautiful too. So much, so, so much to love about this saga and this arc. It was so good. Having said that, I don't actually kind of know what I would give the Skypiea arc because I think overall it was really good and I loved how it complemented the Jaya arc. And I gave the Jaya arc 7.5 and I do think this was like definitely better, but I don't, I, this part of me that's thinking I still prefer Drum Island. Like the Drum Island arc, like I have such an affinity to that arc and I love it so much. I gave Drum Island 8.5 and I've given Alabasta and Arlong Park 9 out of 10. I think like an 8 out of 10, I did love it. But yeah, I just don't think I loved it as much as Drum Island. I don't know if it's quite on par with Drum Island. But it's only 0.5 more than Jaya? Really? Oh, see, this is why I'm starting to, like, doubt my own ratings. Because, yeah, Jaya 7.5. You know what? I might bump Jaya down to 7 and give Skypea an 8 out of 10. I think that's what I'm going to do. Again, I do love how it all connected and things. But when I'm just comparing it to all the other rocks that I've loved, I just don't think I've loved it as much as the ones I just mentioned that have a higher rating. But I do think it could be on par with, like, Romance Dawn, Barate. I think it's pretty much on par with those in, like, terms of, like, how I felt about them. And maybe upon reread, I might love it more. But, yeah, I think that's my rating for now. <laughs> so next, I will watch the J8 filler arc, which a lot of people have been telling me about to, to watch before I get to Long Ring Long Land. I don't know when I'm going to watch that. Maybe while I'm watching the movies. Unless you guys tell me not to watch the movies then, okay. But this is just the first three movies. So if the first three movies are fine to watch, I'm watching them. Those and the G8 filler arc. I will watch them before the Long Ring Long Land arc, which I will be reading next week. And it will be up like a week after this one goes up too. So just before the new year. And that will mean me starting the Water 7 saga, which I'm really excited to get to. I believe Murphy said it's like her favourite saga. So I'm excited to see what all the fuss is about with it. But anyway, that is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave all the comments down below. Let me know your thoughts on the Skypea arc. Let me know your thoughts on the saga in general. Did you agree with my opinions? Did you disagree? Let me know everything down below. I'd love to talk one piece with you. I want to give a huge thank you to my patrons for supporting my channel. If you'd like to join my Patreon or follow me on any social media, then all the links are down in the description box. If you fancy going to Japan next year as well, I have a link down in the description box for that too. But yeah, thanks for watching and I hope I will see you in the next video. Bye!